Uh-huh. And we're in. So how are you doing today? Doing well, man. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Rainy fucking LA. What's going on? Just, I don't know. I, I grew up here my whole life, so it's uh, this is not normal. Not normal. Not, not normal. normal. I feel like 97, I remember it raining a lot, but. 97 and 2024. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's insane because this is my first this is my first winter, right? Yeah. So I haven't seen anything else. This is like all I have to go by. Comparable to like when you were in Dubai. Obviously, you were in Dubai for a while. Or? I was in Dubai for a few years. Yeah. What was the weather there? Just always just dry and hot. Dry and hot. So in the in the winter time, it's um it's dry and warm. So it's like uh, actually it's very temperate. Like it's really nice in the winter time. Uh, and then in the summertime, it's dry, really hot. But the killer about Dubai is in the summertime, it's really humid. Mm-hmm. And the humidity just kills you. Like, my dad lives in Palm Springs. Mm-hmm. And in the summertime out there, it's hot, yeah. but it's dry. So you can go out in the morning, and then it cools off in the afternoon. But in Dubai, it's so humid in the summertime. Um, and then in the evenings, it just seems to get hotter because of the humidity. It's just, it's really rough. So well, even though I lived there for four years, I was kind of like six months on, six months off. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they have all that awesome AC and those brand new, beautiful buildings they're building. World's biggest shopping malls. And yeah. And then, um, and then, but when, as I was starting to leave there, they started figuring out like how to seed the clouds, um, to make sure it rains. Cause they're trying to like grow more produce and they've got farmers and they've got all these people that need fresh water from the sky. So they actually started like, I think they started buying technology from China. Because China, the Chinese have been seeding clouds for the, forever. Uh, they, famously, they did it during the Olympics, the 2008 Olympics, yeah. where they seeded the clouds like a day before the opening ceremonies so that it would rain the day before, not the day of the opening ceremonies. So the day of the opening ceremonies, they had like clear blue skies. Um, and now like people are starting to use this all around the Middle East. That's wild. Yeah. Playing with the weather. What can go wrong? Yeah. <laughs> the, the hand of God will judge us all. Um, <laughs> Can nature be controlled? I think that's the most terrifying thing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm a technology optimist, so I feel like, you know, hopefully good will come from it. Right. Like that, that is, that should always be forever. I hope you hope so. Right. Yeah. 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 Until some like bitter engineer ends up writing the code to to destroy humanity for some AI project. Well, hopefully there's a happier, less bitter engineer overlooking his shoulder and making sure, you know, or her shoulder, making sure that doesn't happen. Hopefully, hopefully. So how's 2024 been for you? 2024 has been good. I'm uh, about to start cutting a new sizzle for a project, for a doc project that I'm pretty excited about. Um, Yeah, it's been good. It's been a little slow. As, As you know, like the business, our business has you know, COVID changed. That's an understatement of the century. Yeah, for sure. It changed a lot. I mean, especially in post-production for editors, it completely changed, uh, you know, just the ability to work from home and moving out of the state to other states and possibly moving out of the country. I have an editor friend who left and cut out of, uh, I think he was in Korea for like seven months. Mm-hmm. And he would just, you know, log into the computer in LA and do his thing. And Amazing. Bob's your uncle. I had a, I, I, I landed a big project a couple of years ago for Discovery Channel, mm-hmm. and um, my editor, Zach Romeo, who I've actually had on the podcast, he was um, one of my first guests because I, I would just love chatting and talking shop with him, mm-hmm. but he was living in Brooklyn with some friends, and then I landed this big project from Discovery Channel. We had to do like 10 expeditions in 10 countries, Oh wow! Um, and I wanted him to do all the post-production and all the post-production supervision. It was going to be like a two-year project, mm-hmm. and he was super smart. The first thing he did was he got out of Brooklyn. So he went back home to like Asheville, North Carolina, which is where he's from. He went to NYU. He's been in, he was in New York forever, but he realized like, holy cow, I can make money on this project. And I, because I was traveling all around the world, I didn't care where he was. As long, as long as I could FedEx him hard drives and then he could send me rough cuts yeah. and we would just have Zoom calls and go back and forth. And he just, you know, he made great money. He saved a ton of money not living in New York. And he was so busy, he didn't even care where he was living. Yeah. Because for two years, it was just all this one project. Yeah. 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 I mean, the only problem I see with it is, uh, you know, with people who are starting out, because I remember when I first started cutting, one of the things that was super beneficial for me was the ability to walk out of my edit bay, go to an edit bay of one of my mentors and sit down and show him what I was working on, get some feedback from him in like this nice environment. Mm-hmm. And uh, or he'd call me or she'd call me over into her edit bay and I'd go sit down and, you know, get a lesson. And I feel like for young people starting out, I would I would almost recommend to them, like, skip the remote jobs 
if you can and take the office jobs because I feel like that cross-pollination that happens amongst editors is really important and and especially you know when I started editing the first show I started editing on was a show called Extreme Makeover Home Edition and it was you know they basically would find these deserving families and tear down their houses and it was a I think it was a nine-day production schedule but the actual construction uh, a house the new house would happen in like seven days oh my god they really <laughs> they would build these beautiful houses um and then they'd reveal it so and then we would oftentimes have like you know by the second season like this was right before probably like peak reality before everything changed with streamers and everything like we had 22 million people tuning in on a sunday to watch this show. 22 million you edited a show that 22 million people a week were watching i mean it was me i was a very small part of it because i was just starting out no no don't play it down 22 million people watch my watch my show that's how you play it. yeah exactly every sunday yeah. they tuned in they, they went right to my seat yeah um, i think at that point when i first started i was cutting like teases Okay. So I was yeah. cutting just these little 30 second things. Um, Still though, man, 22 yeah. million. Isn't that crazy? Like how, uh, where did that audience go? Like that audience, you know, where, where it was like linear TV every Sunday, like 20 million people were walk, tuning in. And now that is like dissipated across YouTube. Yeah. Netflix. I think they all went to Mr. Beast. <laughs> they all stopped watching everything and know that oh, yeah. they're one of his like quarter billion subscribers. Whatever. He's doing great. Yeah. That's wild, yeah. isn't it? I've seen a couple of his things, and yeah, they're super fun. They seem like so much work goes into it. So much money. Yeah. And yeah. Oh, he's big at throwing money yeah. around, right? Like, that's yeah. that's part of his thing. Yeah. My guilty pleasure is, like, uh, Japanese woodworking videos. Okay. I have no talking, just working. Yeah. And, you know, you just watch someone or Korean woodworking videos, American woodworking videos. I started, that was, like, my COVID thing that I started was, like, learning. Woodworking. Woodworking. Oh. Totally random. And oh, who was that? Who was uh, sorry? Who was uh, Ron Sw oh, Ron Swanson on uh, Parks and Rec? Do you remember him? He's a woodworker. Yeah, yeah. He has his own TV show. What's his name? Oh my God, Nick Offerman. Nick Offerman. Love, Thank love you. the hit from the producer. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks so much. <laughs> yeah, Nick, Nick's uh, Nick's awesome, and he ha he has his own like studio. Yeah. in L.A. where he does woodworking. I want to really meet this guy. He's yeah, hilarious. Have it. It's in downtown L.A. If I'm not mistaken, yeah. I think it's. Uh, the name of it's on the tip of my tongue because they do have classes and i was thinking about taking a class at some time like yeah. you know like they, i think they had like a chair building class or uh man what is the name but when i was in school i remember i built a birdhouse that was like my big woodworking accomplishment nice. that was epic yeah i really i really loved it because it's fun like using all those machines mm -hmm. and getting like the with the corners and the twists and everything yeah and having to use your hands and really judge it and like you know use a pencil to draw it out and absolutely that was like that's a real skill yes it is. and it's just not i i was not good at it yeah i i enjoy I, I found it like really therapeutic absolutely yeah yeah i mean i've been into it for about five years and i'm such a novice still i'm just happy when things are square i feel like when i when i put two pieces of wood together as long as that angle is square i'm like this just chasing 90 degree angles yeah we all get started on miters but <laughs> no one day well, that's good. I mean, yeah. that's much better than having a drinking problem or a, a yeah. drug and alcohol, you know, drug yeah. problem after COVID. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I mean, it was, I was lucky in a sense that I started kind of transitioning because I do a lot of sizzles throughout the year. Mm -hmm. I started moving towards a lot of remote work earlier, like about two and a half years before COVID started. Mm -hmm. So when COVID hit, I was pretty prepped for it. I had my system up and running um, and you really don't need a system anymore. I mean, you can, we were in... I just finished last year, at the end of last year, a show for Hello Sunshine called um, Side Hustlers. And it was, you know, it's a it's a show where uh, Emma Grade, Ashley Graham, uh, both super successful businesswomen. Um, I think Emma was part of Skims, like Kim's, Kim Kardashian Skims brand. Oh, that's her like underwear brand. Like, yeah, yeah okay, yeah, I remember that. That's yeah. like one of her companies. Mm -hmm. um, and they basically find women who have these side hustles who are kind of teetering on the edge of becoming a main hustle and kind of helping and guiding them along the process. Interesting. And isn't Ashley Graham a, a model? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. I remember her, yeah. She was a model and a businesswoman. And uh, yeah, it's on Roku. But okay. that was a super, super fun show to do. Um, and I feel like at this point in my career, I just try to find people that are fun to work with. So it's like, it's 
as much as the topic in the show matter to me, it's really the environment. Like, you know how it is. You're working on a show. It's super intimate for, you know, whether it's two months or eight weeks or 10 weeks or 12 weeks or six months or a year. Yeah. Like, you got to like the people that you're working with. Well, especially now. I mean, like you and I are probably, what, like 20 years into this business? It's like, it's it's hard to get up yeah, every day if you're working with shitty people. But you got to do it. I yeah. mean, I, I just always, you know, it's it's funny. Editing is one of those really interesting things in that it's, um, you kind of got to get your teeth kicked in a little bit at the beginning and see if you have the stomach for people just shitting on your work. Um, and just not take it personally. Yeah. And if you can do that, that was kind of my goal for the first five years. I would take a lot of stuff super personally. Now we're beyond 20 years in, in editing and 25 in the business in, in general. Um, and yeah, that's, I feel like that's one of the good skills one can develop as an editor is not to be defensive and take things personally, and be collaborative. You know, even though we are in a room by ourselves working in the dark often for 18 hours, hours a 18 day, hours a day or 20 hours a day or yeah. whatever. Yeah. Uh, I feel like that's one of the things that like people are, that are starting out should learn. I learned it from this really great editor uh peter gamba that i worked with when i was on extreme makeover home edition he's no longer with us unfortunately um but he i remember him taking me aside when i first started because i was you know i was very heated i get defensive about things like you couldn't really say anything it's like you know i don't know if this is the best way to really go about doing this and just kind of gave me lessons because he was like a hard a court new yorker dude and um yeah man it's you know, so much of our business is about this kind of mentorship idea, and especially with editing. Oh yeah, like they'll take it, your people. Yeah, like they'll take an editor from NYU Them. with a you know a degree in filmmaking, and for the first year, he or she will be like a coffee boy, mm -hmm. and that's like you know that's how you pay your stripes, right? Yeah. Which makes no sense to me. Why would you have a, 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 a you know an educated filmmaker getting coffee? Like you can get someone else to do that. Like get that person editing as yeah. quickly as possible. Like mm -hmm. that's why you hired them, him or her. Like just get them doing what you need to do, mm -hmm. and the more they fuck up in the early stages, the, the, but the better there'll be in year two and year three. Yeah. Instead of just getting caught, like this this whole like mentorship, internship, mm -hmm. for free work. Where you have Do to like- Doesn't make any sense to me. Get hurt and then suffer, like the suffering you have to suffer. Cause we all suffered, so you have to suffer too. I mean, I think you bring up a really good point in that, you know, the whole idea of getting people editing. Like uh, if, if you want to do this, if you want to edit, I think the best thing to do is just start editing. Yeah. Like- Sure, you can go and do what I did and, you know, start off as a PA and then you become a coordinator and then someone takes interest in you and you somehow manage to become an assistant editor on a show. And then from there, you're going to, you know, do that for a few years, work days, work nights. And then maybe if you're in the right place at the right time, someone will give you a break or you'll go and, you know, say, hey, give me something to cut or whatever it is. Yeah. I feel like my recommendation to people now would be just be like, just get started. I mean, technology has democratized so much in terms of you can shoot something super awesome on your phone. Um, you can edit on your iPad. Like I, I've used Final Cut Pro on my iPad and I absolutely love it. Um, Black Magic, the your switcher company here, that's another awesome company. They have Resolve, an iPad version. Mm -hmm. um, and there's other other ones i i tend to stay you know because of television we're pretty much all avid right um so that is that. what i use for work 99 percent of the time mm -hmm. um and then you'll see you know there are shows that have premiere um black magic designs davinci resolve which i'm a huge fan of and obviously final cut pro which you know gets mixed feelings but i i think it's kind of like a paradigm shifting program yeah, I think all my guys were using Final Cut Pro yeah. during the day, I know, because yeah. my guys were kind of more classically trained, mm -hmm. so that was always the big, the big editing program back in the day. Yeah, and then remember when they switched to ten, people lost their minds because they were like, "This is nothing like we had before," because it was like a real paradigm shift, and and I think that takes so much courage. Like a lot of people slam Apple. I'm a huge Apple fanboy, obviously, um, because I feel like what they did, you know, when I first started. I, the first show I was an AE on was this show called American High, and it was for uh, for Fox back in the day, and it was uh, by this brilliant dude named R.J. Cutler, awesome editors. Uh, it was the first time I learned about Munster Cheese, 
we had an editor there named Dave Tedeschi who was a uh, who I actually was a sandwich boy, so I went and got him a sandwich. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> We've all got that story. Yeah, and he's like, with Munster. I'm like, what's Monster Cheese? I've never heard of it. He's like, you never. And he's a New Yorker. Yeah. And delis are not a huge thing if you grow up in LA. It's not it's huge, huge in yeah, New York. Huge yeah. in New York. So, um, yeah, I went over there and that was that was my first show. But, like, you know, we were editing on Avid's. They were called like MC 9000, I think, if I'm not mistaken. A memory may be a little not right on this, but they were $100,000 machines. Mm -hmm. You know, when Apple bought from Macromedia Final Cut Pro, and I remember holding that Final Cut beta and I could run it on my G3 or G4. It was a G4 that I had at the time. This is back like 20 years ago. Yeah, 20 years ago. And now you had a system like editing all of a sudden was now like a thousand dollar thing as opposed to a hundred thousand dollar thing. Democratized. Democratized. And you can run it on a much cheaper computer as opposed to like, you know, because it was like it was the computer, then it was the cards, then it's the storage space and it's all of these things. Like when we used to digitize material back in the day we were selective like we would pop in the beta mm -hmm. into the beta deck you'd go through and log the clips that were meaningful and useful because you only had so much storage it wasn't like today where it's just import everything you have everything on online yeah. and pick and choose so um yeah i'm a big apple fan in that they completely changed the game and also a big uh grant petty black magic fan because they've completely changed the game too yeah. just with what they've done with Resolve, what they've done with the cameras. I mean, the fact that you have an awesome system here. Thank you. You're right for this podcast, and this is stuff that, you, you know, one can go and buy off the shelf. Obviously, it's an investment, but, like, you can do this. And you can, you can run it on your own, too. Yeah. That's, the, that's the real key. Yeah. Like, I've, um, I, was, I was speaking to someone the other day, and I was just saying, like, I really wanted to have a setup that I could run by myself mm -hmm. because, like, to have a producer helping me, first of all, it's a cost. Yeah. Um, and until you're generating any revenue, it's not really worth it. Mm -hmm. But then too, like, you know, to have someone like yourself come here, you know, you set a time, mm -hmm. you got to come across town in, in the rain and yeah. traffic. And then for you to be here on time, but for a producer to be late or to be sick mm -hmm. or to have another job or something like that, like, it's just too much. So yeah. like, I mean, I really, for me to like be able to really plan and organize and invite people and mm -hmm. then have them dedicate their time to come and see me which i'm grateful for mm -hmm. um i just needed to make sure i could run the whole thing by myself yeah, yeah. no and it's and you're doing it fluidly so it's like yeah look at what technology does it's it allows you a person who's experienced and has been in this business forever to expand their bandwidth right yeah and i feel like that's only going to increase when you start bringing things like ai into the fold where you have experts like ourselves mm -hmm. using these tools and i feel like that's another reason why we shouldn't be afraid of them you know like there's a whole lot of fear mongering out there. Oh, lots, yeah. You know, AI is gonna, AGI is gonna flip all the switches and we're gonna kill ourselves. I feel like humans do plenty good job of destroying each other on their own. We don't need any extra help. And I, like I said, as a technology optimist, I really think like these tools will do a couple of things. They'll allow people who would have never been able to do a lot of the things that we do um, without putting the time. It'll They'll allow them to kind of uh, take a shortcut and get into this business and maybe create some things that they wouldn't have necessarily been able to do otherwise. On the other side of it, I think for experts, like that, it just elevates that game a lot more. Like you give, you know, a really good engineer access to a really good large language model and let them code with it. They're going to do a lot better than me. Who's like a weekend programmer, mm -hmm. obviously. Right. Because there's so much more that goes into creating an application there's architecture, there's structure, there's, you know, there's just like an engineering mindset that happens in the same with story, right? Like we have structure, we have all of those things. So like give that to people that make stories who know what, how long, you, you know, what it takes to make a story and you have something pretty amazing, I think. You know, um, speaking of pushing the limits and the technological boundaries, I was in Vegas a couple of weeks ago and saw, I went to the Sphere and saw uh, Darren Aronofsky's uh, postcard from Earth. Oh, wow. And um, and so I went in kind of not knowing what to expect. Uh, I bought the tickets, and I saw Darren Aronofsky, obviously Oscar-nominated director, had no idea he'd been working on this project for years. And um, it turned out that uh, what they did was they created their own camera for this project, and it's 16K. Holy moly. And they were shooting it. It's like a, the, the, the camera itself is like a sphere. Obviously, the theater is the sphere, 
but the camera is like a, a, a spherical and it has lenses in multiple locations. So it, it kind of captures almost like a 3D image mm -hmm. because if you've ever been in the sphere in Las Vegas, it, the, the walls are, the, the screen is curved, right? Yeah. And the whole inside of the sphere is a screen. So, so now you're, you're in a helicopter flying through the Dolomites, uh, for example, and you've got this 16K, um, more than 180 degree, but not quite 360. Like it wasn't behind you, yeah. but it was kind of your entire periphery, your entire peripheral vision, sorry, was covered um, in this 16K imagery. And it was just, a, it was like 50 minutes of just being mind blown by the most amazing uh, na natural cinema, uh, nature cinematography I've ever seen. Do you get like the wooziness when you're in a space like that? Like, so you know what they did was they fucking, uh, <laughs> You know what they did was they they wanted to make it like immersive like yeah. like 4D or whatever so they made the chairs shake oh, no. and and actually like if I'm starting to feel a little like shaky because of you know the massive visual effects that mm -hmm. that I'm getting if the chair starts shaking that's almost what makes me feel a little bit ill yeah like uh, Universal Studios yeah that's you, what I was yeah yeah I, that. I was thinking like the Star Wars ride or something like that it's the Harry Potter one that gets me like it's like you or not the Harry Potter no. not the Harry Potter one it's um. Is it Harry Potter? There is a Harry Potter one there. I can't remember which one it was, um, but I, 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 anyways, I, I remember just sitting in a chair and everything was moving and the chair was moving and I was just like, this is too much for yeah. me. So until the chair moves, I'm pretty much okay. Yeah. Yeah. Whenever I go to like Universal Studios, I just use it as an excuse to just eat a ton of just sugary garbage that I wouldn't normally eat. Yeah. And hate yourself forever. Yeah. And poor. But absolutely. Have a great time. Yeah, absolutely. Have a great time. So look, um, when did you get, I mean, like, where are you from? Let's go back and okay. find out a little bit about who you are, what's going on. Yeah, so my name is Human Shikarchi. Um, I came here with my family uh, in the early 80s. We left Iran, and my mom is from Africa, so we were in Africa visiting family for a little while. And obviously, uh, history knows what happened in Iran, and it was the... I was born during the revolution, actually, in 79. Okay, so we're about the same age. Yeah, I was born in 78. Yeah. So, wow, that's crazy. So, we're, yeah. were you in Tehran? Yeah, so I was born in Tehran, and uh, we were there for, I feel like, about two years. And then started being like, maybe we should leave. Wow. And then left, came here in the 80s, early 80s. Did you get a chance to ever, just before we go on, did you ever get a chance to go back and, like, explore your own homeland? I haven't. No? I haven't. And And, I mean... I'm, I'm sure I could have. I've, I've had cousins come and go, um, but I feel like because I was so young and then I became so uh, Americanized, yeah, you know, and then my dad passed away 20 some odd years ago. So like he was the Iranian in the family. So like my Farsi was great when he was alive and sadly has just gotten worse and worse and worse. So now I'm like on Instagram, like trying to follow uh, Iranian uh, accounts to just like listen to the Farsi and try to make my Farsi a little bit better. But uh, yeah, so we we left and, and came here and came straight to LA because LA had the largest population of Iranians outside of Iran. Yeah, they're all in Westwood. Yeah, yeah, yeah I know. Yeah. So my parents had a restaurant. It was mm -hmm. called Shigarchi Restaurant back in the day. Um, and obviously it closed in 2001, but my cousins and uncles uh, have the restaurant, um, but we're not not affiliated with that anymore in the restaurant business. Amazing. So um, I got to tell you a story. Yeah. Okay. So um, in 2002, mm -hmm. I uh, I traveled from Hong Kong to Istanbul over land and it took me like six months. And uh, so I was, I went, you know, I went from Hong Kong into mainland China, you know, up to Beijing, along the Silk Road, all the way out to Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, mm -hmm. Holy moly. Um, Iran. Iran, Azerbaijan, Georgia, Turkey, and then finished up in Istanbul. And and I was in Turkmenistan, which is already a crazy place to be. But I was like, I'm going to take the land border. I'm going to cross the land border into Iran. So Turkmenistan is just north east of Iran. So I was going south. And uh, and I and the closest major city to Iran and Turkmenistan, the Turkmenistan border is Mashhad. Uh, which is a really holy place. They have got a special, a uh, very special mosque there. Um, so I remember coming across that border, and uh, and this passport control woman at the on the leaving Turkmenistan was no problem. Then you've got no man's land, and then you get to the Iran side. They've got like a bus that goes back and forth, and then when you get to Iran, they check your passport, right? And I was the only foreigner on the bus that day, probably that month, and this woman was checking my passport and. 
she started this was 2002 remember mm-hmm. and she started like yeah she had an awesome time to be over there not not at all uh i think like i think like a, a couple months before iran was named like part of the axis of evil yeah so it's terrible yeah um but this lady was convinced i was a journalist and uh and she kept me there so with the, I, I crossed the border at like two or three in the afternoon thinking like okay that'll be enough time to get a taxi and go into Mashhad in the day, day line, right? Because you don't want to be crossing borders at night and trying to pick up taxis on the in the middle of nowhere in the dark. It's just bad news. But this lady kept me there on purpose uh, until all the taxis were gone and it was pitch black out. Mm. And then she stamped me through and let me go. Nuts. And I was just such a fuck you, like right on day one in Iran. Yeah. But then but then the rest of my trip was amazing. Like yeah. I managed to get to Mashhad and then I took the train to Tehran and then I went down to uh, Qom. I went down to Isfahan. I went down to Shiraz. I went down to Bandar Abbas. Wow. I went to Ka- I went to um, I went to uh, I went to the Bam Citadel before the earthquake because remember the earthquake destroyed it. Terrible, terrible earthquake. And then I went into the Dash to Kavir, and then I went back up to Tehran, and then I went out to like Kazvin and up the northwest into like Azerbaijan and stuff mm-hmm. like that. And I loved it. I've been to Iran three times. I absolutely loved it. it was- yeah, these people are amazing. Yeah. So the food, the history, the culture. Yeah. Like most inviting, they will give you everything in their home. Yeah. yeah. It's, yeah. Just bad shit, crazy government. Sadly. It's, uh. How many stories do we have like that around the world? It's, it, yeah. I mean, it's, and it's all a matter of perspective, right? Yeah. You know, there's probably a podcast happening over there and they're just like, those Americans are out of their fucking mind. Well, I'm Canadian and Americans are out <laughs> of their minds. So I, uh, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm a third wheel on this conversation. <laughs> Yeah, it's a, uh, yeah, I, I love it here. I think it's been, I mean, it's been awesome for us, you know. Um, it's free and clear. It's pretty fun. Um, you know, again, and if you, if you make English language content, this is the only country to really be in. Yeah. Everything happens here, whether you, whether you're, whether you get hired here and you film all around the world or whatever, like mm-hmm. this is where all the creative energy is. Yeah. And I mean, people, people knock LA, but I feel like, like for the few people who actually get to meet people who grew up out here and are from here, like we're pretty normal people. Yeah. You know, you'll see social media posts of people like, this is the most terrible, lonely city in the world. And it's like, I guess if you hang around a lot of superficial people that came here from other places and stuff. And uh, uh, This podcast has actually been wonderful because like yeah. relocating here a few months ago, like getting to sit down with people for like two hours at a time. Yeah. You break through all that. It's like the superficial garbage. Like you just, and then you really get to know people. And then if you do like a hundred podcasts, all of a sudden you have like a hundred really good friends that you've you know, really connected with. Yeah. And uh, it's such a great way to like not feel lonely, to c- to kind of feel like you're connected to some kind of community, right? And it's, it's like, you know, it's almost like you're building your own little community Absolutely. of creatives. Absolutely. And I feel like, I mean, what an awesome way to just kind of find out what people's perspective are, are not only the business, but just, um, you know, where it's going, you know, what they're doing, what emerging markets they see, like, mm-hmm. yeah. And and then you, you, were, you mentioned earlier, you had a like a ex pro tennis player on here too, so kind of outside of the normal, everything, everything. Yeah. Like um, I'm, I'm, ch- I, I, you know, I'm just, I'm interested in everything. Yeah, and it's funny because like people come on the podcast and they're like, "What, what should I prepare?" I'm just, uh, we're just gonna talk about Shut you. Up. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, just show up. Yeah, and it's like, oh, like you know, what's gonna be the theme? And I'm like, there's no theme, and, and like, because everyone has like these self help themes and like you know therapy or some kind of business theme, and I understand that because it's probably easier to monetize and get sponsors yeah. and have like. An, a pitch or like an angle mm-hmm. or a, a hook. Yeah. But what if it's just like people just catching up and talking like yeah. two creative people who make stuff want to catch up and mm-hmm. just have a chat. Like yeah. it, it doesn't really matter what the topic is or where we go. Yeah. You can't beat it. Can't beat it. I feel like I am. I, it's, I just started lifting weights again for the first time in six months. Oh, that's, that's a tough, yeah. Tough comeback. Yeah. I started with legs. I'm like, let's just get the terrible thing out of the way. But it's one of those things where I, I was telling my wife, I was like, I don't like uh, kind of setting like, all right, tomorrow I'm going to start exercising. Because whenever I do that, I never do it. Mm-hmm. So it's more of like I just give myself the the space and just the spontaneity be like, all right, now. And get up. I have a little, one of those little rogue mini racks in my backyard. So I just grab my bar and go outside and crush it and squat. Work it, it out. I don't know if I would call it crushing it. I'm getting crushed. You are getting crushed. You're getting crushed. But it's it's fun. And I feel like Exercising is just one of those things. It sucks at the beginning, but man, does it feel great at the end, right? Absolutely, yeah. And you know, if you're doing, you know, if you get to do, if if you're working in production and stuff like that, either you're sitting for long hours editing, or yeah. or if you're out in the field, 
you got to carry stuff. You got to be mm-hmm. moving. Like you got to keep yourself in pretty good shape. Yeah. I mean, obviously beyond the mountain climbing and stuff, even just working on urban productions, like Absolutely. you've got backpacks, you've got cameras are heavy. Uh, cameras are heavy. I mean, once you rig with those bad boys out, you got 40 pounds on your shoulder for 12 hours a day. Yeah. And that is not fun. No. Like I, have a, I have a couple of friends who are DPs and all back problems. All back problems all, all back the time. Problems, all shoulder problems, shoulder surgeries, back problems, you know. I love to. I love they came out with those things. It's like a backpack with like a little a little hook on the top, yeah, and it takes the weight right off of you, and you can really move with it. I saw that first. It was um, like zero point zero mm-hmm. on um, on Bourdain's show, um, Parts Unknown. Yeah. That was like the first time I saw people using that. Like I was like more than ten years ago, yeah. right? and uh, I was like, that's a, that's a great way to shoot in a city. It's a little bit more hard if you're out in the wild because it's a bit of a tough setup to have on for like a really long time. Yeah. But um, but that just just taking the weight off and having it just stabilize and you can walk and move mm-hmm. with your with your host and stuff like that is such a such a wicked uh, wicked kind of setup. Yeah, I have one of those steady rigs at home. It's yeah. like a Tilta. I think it's called like a Tilta Glide or something. Mm. And yeah, again, another democratized thing. Like you know, you used to hire a steady cam person to come in. So I done, I've done a lot of home shows, and one of the things you would do at the end of a home show, at the beginning and the end, is you would have the steady cam operator come through and do a walk through so you have all your before b-roll right and then after you've cut the show and done all the you know decorating and made the house look awesome and you're about to do the reveal you have them come through and do all the post b-roll mm-hmm. of the space and you know you would pay those guys a lot of money and now you can you know i'm not saying you're gonna just by buying a rig you're not gonna become an awesome shooter yeah <laughs> fair enough right. yeah it's not just the equipment you just have the equipment now yeah. but you can get the equipment for under a couple grand which is exceptional mm-hmm. you know um the fact that you can get a drone for like 100 bucks it's wild yeah it? it's yeah. wild but again it all comes back down to the operator the expertise like i have a camera at home i can't shoot as well as the shows as the dudes and and ladies that shoot on the shows that i work on right um but i'm still trying i've been taking photos since i was a child so yeah. obviously like that, you know, the photography side is, is good, but being able to frame is, is like usually the most important thing. Hands yeah. down. Yeah. Kind of composition, lighting, like things like that. And, and, you know, once it's funny with editing, like you learn all these rules, like all these things you're supposed to do, all these things you were not supposed to do. And then after a while, it really just becomes a feel thing, right? Fully. What kind of feeling does this give me? It's a good feeling or is it a bad feeling? What's the story that I'm trying to tell? You know, it's, it's, uh, it's funny. I feel like as you become more experienced in this thing, you kind of figure out that the thing you're trying to say is not actually the thing you're trying to say. It's the thing behind that. And maybe sometimes behind that, that you're trying to say. Yeah. So it's like, how do you creatively construct a scene to say that thing without like overtly, you know, like, uh, an example would be, um, how do you make people sad in a scene or like make people react like there's emotion in the scene like you know you can't just show people crying no you know which is terrible especially if they're fake crying all the time you just cut to people crying it's like i didn't you didn't earn that yet you know what i mean so it's like it's all those little things that you know you just learn with time you figure it out with time and stuff so Mm -hmm. i think yeah the layering Mm -hmm. of those emotions yeah Yeah. Yeah. sound design like that's one of my favorite things um I got someone coming out in a couple of weeks, actually, who's like really? who does sound design and, and music composition for mm-hmm. movies and film because I really want to get into because, like, when I was making like Tough Rides and Extreme Treks, yeah, like those are two totally different series. Like Tough Rides is all about like rah rah, let's get on the bike and move, and Extreme Treks is like we're walking through the desert, everything's super slow, right? Mm-hmm. And the music has to be totally different. And I just love like music composition and integrating music and sound design into film and television and how the, and really trying to create those layers and those mm-hmm. moods. So that you can, you know, you can show people a wide open desert and have that soft flowing music and bring mm-hmm. people in and then have them cut back to you in that space, you know, you going through. Silence. Yeah. With silence. You can't have silence. silence. Yeah. I mean, silence is another thing. Like, it's all these little things, right? When you're telling a story, like, it's, a good, it's all the nuanced stuff that, that I feel like unless you do it, you can't really articulate what it is. Um, but like, you know, the spacing, if you're uh, trying to, lay out the initial part of a story like the spacing between bo mm-hmm. you know i'll spend forever before i even add any music or even video if i'm just if i have someone's vo just getting the spacing right yeah you know getting the rhythm of their words right because oftentimes it's not almost always like the way that they said it you know i'll i'll cut words 
and space them out. So they kind of flow. And then once you start adding music and sound effects, and uh, I think one of the perks of being a nonfiction slash reality a- editor is that we get to do so much. You know what I mean? Absolutely, like, yeah. Because it's not scripted, right? So you get you get to you get to drive the music, yeah. make the sound effects, yeah. not pick the look and feel. Oftentimes, if it's not, uh, you know, you do you are collaborating with other people. You have an executive producer. You have a co EP who's usually running post production. Um, but you don't listen to them. Should it? I've been really lucky, man. I've been really lucky with the people that I've gotten. Mm-hmm. I've I've gotten to work with really good people. That's and of good. course, you have bad people. And I feel like the bad people are always lessons too because. If you worked at a bad company, there, you just got uh, a college course on how not to run a company mm-hmm. or how you think you shouldn't run a company. If you worked at, like, had bad workflow, boom. Yeah. That's a that's a huge lesson to not do it that way. Yeah, and then you figure out, you know, how to improve it on the next project. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so you left Iran at the age of two, and you came straight to L.A. Straight to L.A. Do you remember that at all? Like, I do, actually. I do remember. It's funny. I have a few memories of Iran. Um my mom had a garden and I remember like pulling out a carrot and like st- sticking it in my mouth, like straight from the dirt. And I remember like the dirt taste. Uh, someone was holding me outside and it was snowing. And I asked my mom like, uh, when was this? Like when it was snowing, she's like, how did you remember that? So yeah. just like these little flashes. Sounds like North Tehran in the winter where you, you, know, you got the mountains and stuff like that. Yeah. And they get snow on the, they get snow yeah, on so the I think you, if I'm not mistaken, I believe we, I, I was born in Tehran, but we lived in Esfahan. Oh really? Yeah, okay, that's, so we, that's where we live. Yeah, uh, Isfahan is the most beautiful city in Iran. Yeah, I think. Yeah, I'm absolutely loved it. I don't have a lot of memory about Iran in general. I do remember one thing, and I think this was at the. I can't remember if it was at the beginning of the the, the war, um, with Iraq, but I do remember my parents would sit with all the lights off in the backyard drinking tea, and there'd be like explosions and and like booms and anti aircraft fire or whatever it was. Like I don't know exactly what it was. I'm not a military professional, um, obviously, um, but I remember just being absolutely like scared out of my mind as a little kid running around the backyard screaming. So yeah. that's one of my three memories. In the middle of war. Yeah. Yeah. And I remember coming here and the meeting, you know, going through customs and everyone was super nice. This was Reagan's America. Mm-hmm. Um, very inviting. A lot different uh, than today for people that were coming from the Middle East. Sure. Uh, I can imagine. But... Yeah, got here, moved, uh, we're, we're pretty much like right around the Westwood area, which is where all the Persians go to. Yeah. Um, went to school. Where'd you, where, where'd you go to school? So I went to a private school out here. I didn't go to college. Okay. I When I graduated high school, I looked at college and it just didn't make financial sense for me. Mm-hmm. Like I wasn't super, super smart to where I had like scholarships. I didn't really know what I wanted to do with my life. Um, did your did your high school have like a audio like visual a, center or anything like that where you were able to like borrow cameras, borrow still cameras, do post production on anything? Nothing, nothing, nothing. I mean, I because at a private school you would expect them to have like some facilities. Yes, they all do now. Yeah, they, I'm sure yeah. they. I'm sure the school has it now. Has everything now. Like it seems like they have. Every, I still keep in touch with uh, some of the people and the woman that runs it now. Um, but yeah, it it it's uh. I did not have any of that stuff. I think they, they had like a computer lab because this was, it's funny, like our generation, you and I, we were, we had a whole childhood that was completely analog. Totally analog. Right? Yeah. Like we had phones that with the things and you had the dial, dial tones mm-hmm. and like, you know what I mean? So like we remember a time when there was no computers. Do you remember how fucking pissed off you used to be when a phone number had too many nines in it? Cause you had to go like all the way, all the way, all the way. I can still feel the friction amount. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. Those things were tanks, though. They were. They were beasts. I mean, if someone broke into your home and you had one of those next to your bed, that's a weapon. Yeah. And <laughs> also worked with the power out. That's which. Good luck using phones your phones that work with the power without having a battery. Yeah. yeah. Pretty cool. So, yeah. Um, did you play sports or anything like I that did. at high school? I played, I played basketball in high school. Oh, we nice. Were, me too. We were a Division 5 AA, which is. <laughs> But down there, right? Yeah, yeah that's down there. there. Yeah. I think we made it to the playoffs like once or twice. Okay. Um, I played uh, uh, basketball, but I did martial arts from like when I was six years old to 15, 16, 17. Oh, wow. So that was a big part of your career. Yeah, massive. I mean, it was, I, I like, I, I always. Uh, what, what, uh, what, um, what, style. what were you studying? Yeah. What style of martial arts? So I was studying this thing called Kempo Karate. Um, and so our, the grandmaster of our system was uh, Ed Parker. 
and is that name he, sounds super familiar. He's very famous. Yeah. He was uh, his claim to fame. I mean, not his one claim to fame, but like to the public, people who are outside of kind of Kempo Karate and maybe martial arts in general, was that he was Elvis's bodyguard. Elvis Presley. Elvis Presley. So Elvis would do some stuff. And it's funny, in, in our studio, my teacher's name was Brian Hawkins, incredible human being. Um, I always looked at him as like a second dad because uh, my parents were in the restaurant business. So they were working a lot. And f and is ruthless. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, and, and weekends especially, like that's when they were doing their caterings and, and working at somebody else's house. So like I spent a lot of time in the in the studio, uh, in the martial arts studio. <clears throat> but uh, one of the funny things was we had a suede on display this was uh ed parker's studio after ed parker died the system kind of splintered out and everybody who was a student under him a lot of them went off and started their own kind of shingles their little kempo shingles um but before any of that happened there was a blue suede elvis presley like uh karate outfit that was in a glass display case on the back side of the studio so when you cross the mat on your way to the locker room, you'd always stop, and I'd always stop and look at this, and I'd be like, "It's like it was like velvet." I'm like, "How is that comfortable?" Like when he sweats in that, and you're like a little six, seven year old kid. And that was from Elvis. I don't know. I never got a. I never got a straight answer. But my mom was a huge Elvis fan, so I, uh, I, I had Mr. Parker. Um, my instructor Brian Hawkins had Mr. Parker get my mom like a couple autographed. Uh, photos of him and Elvis together. Which oh, that's cool. cool. Yeah, yeah, that's wild. Yeah. I, I think like Mark, like I think kids have to be physically active mm -hmm. at a young age. Right. And it's like, if you don't really want to get involved in team sports, like I was always on team sports. Like, yeah. um, my dad was in the 1972 Olympics. He played water polo. Right? Oh, wow. So that's a fucking brutal sport. He owed two max through the roof. I bet <laughs> he was fit. Yeah. It was scary actually. Um, but I, and he tried to get me into that and I just, I got tired of being beaten up all the time. Mm -hmm. So I was like, so, but then I kind of gravitated towards basketball, which is also a team sport, which mm -hmm. is great. But uh, but if you if you're into individual sports, you know you've got golf, you've got tennis. Yeah. Uh, but martial arts are, are crucial. Like you like yeah. these are like lessons that kids need to learn, like discipline, training, being on time. Yeah. You know, respecting your coaches and everything like that. Like everyone should do some martial arts at some stage. Absolutely agree. I I would say martial arts or dance even like these kind of like I feel like tennis martial arts some form of dance like if you're not into either sports or you know getting kicked in the face whatever it is i lost a bunch of teeth back here i remember once um as a teenager which was fun <laughs> but uh, if you're not there's something about those sports in particular especially when you start them at a young age like the way i move is because of these classes that I took when I was five, six years old, as I was learning how to move, as I was learning how to run, you know what I mean? Like it's, it's like almost embedded into just the way movement works. So like, it was always easy to take those martial arts skills and transfer them to like another sport. Like, let's say it's weightlifting or something, just because you know, almost how to mimic movement. So when someone's teaching you something, and you can understand just like the form of the body and the mechanics of the body. Like, you know, when I started playing tennis much later in life, I already had a concept of like what a kinetic chain was yeah. in the body. You know what I mean? So and like being in an athletic position yeah. and body movement Absolutely. and balance Absolutely. yeah, and all this kind of stuff and footwork. Yeah. 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 Footwork, which is massive. You know, one of the things we would do, you know, when we do our forms in our martial arts is, you know, you do them forwards and then you do the form backwards oh that's right yeah it used to like to like go out three steps and then come back. yeah yeah just do the, the whole sequence in reverse because that was the whole idea with this thing you know the the whole point i remember my teacher be like the reason you're practicing all this stuff over and over and over and over again is to build kind of like this spontaneous part of your brain so when it is called into action it just works second nature yeah, yeah absolutely and i feel like yeah one of the best things my mom and dad did was was signing me up for martial arts as a young kid because like you said the self-discipline is second to none and you got to learn how to take a hit at some stage in life yes absolutely and you realize that it made me a pacifist <laughs> my left i was like yeah i just i don't like getting punched in the face mm -hmm. not really my jam no i remember <laughs> i remember i was working back in the day i was i was freelancing as a photographer in china for like 12 years, I think. And I worked for the New York Times and Time Newsweek, Forbes, Fortune, a whole bunch. And I remember I got this one assignment from um, Der Spiegel, mm. the German magazine. And uh, one of the writers came out from Hamburg. 
and uh, a really nice guy. I can't re recall his name, but maybe I can find the article. Um, and we went to um, South Central China, and we met with a boxing phenom, a Chinese boxing phenom. And um, he had just won the gold medal, and well, it was 2004. It was like Athens, I think. And he won the gold medal as a flyweight in boxing, and he didn't get hit for the whole Olympic tournament. Like he won gold, but he but no one landed a punch on him, and 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 he like came out of nowhere. So we went down and and did a rep and so as he was training for the Beijing Olympics, I think this was like 2007, 2006. As he was training for the Beijing Olympics in 2008, we went down and did like a big profile on him, spent some time with him and stuff like that. And I remember like the, the training, the, the discipline that this guy had, like just the, it was like in the nun, right? Yeah. It was, it was inspiring. And yeah. he was like, he was, I think he was like 18 or 19. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I mean, I, I, I have the most respect for people that do that. I'm not. I'm not really into like the contact sports anymore. Well, you just got to be as fast as him. He doesn't get hit. <laughs> yeah, right. That's the thing. Like, it's like, it's like, I'm just going to, you know, go to Olympic level boxing and it's just going to be a sparring match because yeah. no one can hit me. Yeah. And he, he was so fast. Like it, it was because he would do sparring with his coach and his, and his coaches couldn't hit him. Uh, uh, amazing. And the other Olympic athletes apparently couldn't hit him either. And then he became a pro boxer and I saw him in Macau and he was rep by Don King for a while. Oh, wow. Um, and then I saw him box in Macau at a, it was a Manny Pacquiao fight, Manny Pacquiao way back in the day, mm -hmm. Filipino God. Yeah. Um, and he was like the second match before Pacquiao would come out as a flyweight or something. And I, I never followed up with seeing what happened, but I'm curious. One, yeah. Because I got to like, I got to go to see some karate and mm -hmm. I got to see like, um, you know, in Wu in, uh, in like Wuxi warriors, yeah. like all these like monks that do like Kung Fu training. Yeah. 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 I got really got into this in China. I didn't uh, participate myself, but I ended up documenting a lot of it. That's awesome. It was really fun. Yeah, super rich culture. Yeah, China's where it's at. Yeah, I know, I know, I know. You know, we're supposed to be enemies and stuff, but no. I cannot deny the richness of the culture. Yeah. So, so you went to a private school, fifth division basketball team. That's that's tough. <laughs> double A. <laughs> double, <laughs> double, <laughs> double A. Um, and, and then yeah and then what was it like after what do you what do you, what do you want to do what do you i had no idea what i wanted to do i was always into video i didn't know how or what but i i, I realized did you like watching movies was it love like, watching movies yeah. i would watch movies over and over and over just try to understand why a certain thing would make me feel yeah the, like, ta the tarantino school of filmmaking yeah, yeah just watch movies i feel like for like the first 10 years when i started in this business was reservoir dogs reservoir dogs was, that was amazing because i'm like man how is this movie so good they're literally in a fucking room yeah and i love all these characters mr pink and they're mr white terrible fucking people mm -hmm. yeah but i'm rooting for them and i'm just like on the edge of my seat the whole time so yeah so well cast so good yeah yeah i still watch reservoir dogs like yeah. like i remember a couple months ago i was in uh i was in i was up in the mountains and i was like Every day I was hiking and blah, blah, blah. And then like we had this huge storm come in for like three days and I just watched all of Quentin Tarantino's movies mm -hmm. in like a two or three day period. Yeah. And just fell in love with everything all over again. Yeah, I mean, the yeah. opening scene of Inglorious Bastards. Teach that. Yeah. School forever, right? <laughs> yeah, so I had I had no idea what I wanted to do. And uh, I think that's common for everyone though. Right? Like I didn't really know what I wanted to do. Yeah. Sports kept me on the straight and narrow. If it wasn't for that, I would have been all over the yeah, place. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And I feel like I... I I think I got a job at Best Buy for like six months after graduating. After graduating, what did your parents think? Because you, know, you came, you came, you're coming from Iran, right? Like, yeah, they're super about education and yeah. you know, that stuff. I would have figured, but private school, you know, private school that we went to was expensive, and they luckily had, you know, a super nice in situation with the administrators that ran that place because, like, my mom was not like we were not wealthy, so she was paying the payments monthly. Mm. You know what I mean? It wasn't where, like, you know, in tuition, at, I think at the time it was probably like eight or nine grand. It's significantly more now. It's probably 70 grand by now. Probably. Yeah, it's probably like four or five times. And I think we got a little bit of like a like a scholarship help out thing, um, which helped, helped the cost a little bit. But I have to say, like, you know, I grew up in West L.A., so I would have probably gone to Palms Middle School and Venice High School, mm -hmm. um, which, you know, depending on who you ask, Venice does have like a strong, at that time, was a little different you know they do have a strong academic program now but it was uh, more alternative kind of back in the day no i think it was just like there was like a lot of gangs in the 90s in la obviously right so like it was uh that's an understanding yeah like the 90s uh and the 80s and stuff and so 
you know, the area that I grew up in wasn't like, it's really nice now, but like, um, wasn't awesome back then. No. So yeah, they were I pretty bummed that I didn't go to college afterwards. But when I explained to him, like, you know, I don't know what I want to learn and I'm going to spend all this money. So I'm going to get loans and now I'm going to, you know, finish college and be stuck with a hundred thousand dollar loan. And I know people that have done that. And if, you know, and, and people who have their school paid for by their parents, I think that's great too. You know, um, that was not my situation. Yeah. So like, you know, as a, you know, your early twenties or a teenager thinking about, okay, so when I start life, I'm going to just start a hundred thousand in the hole, or maybe it's less than that, 50,000. Maybe it's more than that. Maybe it's more than yeah. that. A lot of people did it. And, you know, some people love it. Some people thought it was maybe not the best idea. Um, I've just been incredibly lucky. You know, in that I had a cousin who happened to know somebody who was like, hey, do you want to be a PA on this pilot? And it was a pilot with uh, Ben Stein. He had a, like a talk show pilot. And it was uh, his first guest was Jimmy Kimmel. Oh, wow. So that was like my first PA job in 1990 something, 99 or 98. Um, and it's funny, I actually remember walking onto the stage after like, you know, clearing up some trash and stuff. And just standing there, be like, man, this is so cool. And like, I'm like being the cameras on the stage and the table and stuff, and not paying attention that the stage is white. I have dirty fucking sneakers on, and I've tracked like 50 steps of just shit into the onto the stage. Rookie move, yeah, rookie move. The director was like, I'm like, hey man, how are you? He's like super happy, like PA guy, like, and and uh, I was like, how are you, man? Uh, he's like, doing great. Mind getting your dirty fucking shoes off of my set? I've touched or you know, to try to like wipe stuff off. Um, but yeah, that was my first PA job. I think that was like an MTV show or something. And then um, with with no background in film or television, I just got sucked into that world. Got sucked in. And I think I was getting paid like 80 bucks a day and you get like mileage was like 25 cents a mile or something like that. Yeah. And that, oh, that's right. You get paid to drive your car in LA, you don't paid, you? Yeah. You get paid to go drop off packages and pick up packages and drop off people at the airport. Um, yeah, and I did that, and then I started working on the show uh, World's Wildest P Police Videos. Um, oh, I remember that. I remember uh, those shows, yeah, where you'd like... like another Fox show that you, would get like 10 million people to tune in on whatever evening it was on. Because all the cars had cameras on the front, and it was, it was just all like high-speed car chases. Yeah, it was actually genius. It was a, a company, the name of the company is Paul Stojanovich Productions, uh, and it was this guy, Paul Stojanovich, who was like a stringer when he was 19 years old, so we started following ambulances around and police... Ambulance yeah. chaser. Yeah. yeah. And in like in and I think he was from Portland, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. And so he had started going around, I think, if I remember the story correctly, and buying dash cams for police stations and police uh just, you know, like municipalities for every single cop car that they had there, with the caveat that I will install this camera. Whatever you record belongs to me. Obviously, if it's not breaking any law and if it's not some part of an open case. And and that's how it started, but it was like a what a deal to cut, huh? Like how I'm not how, sure if that was actually the the mechanics of the deal, but that's the way I remember it being explained to me. Yeah, because I mean, like, because all filmmakers need content, right? So where are you going to get the content from? And if you can just buy a bunch of cheap cheap dashboard cameras, yeah, and put them on in in all these cop cars and get this, you know, police officer manager to agree <laughs> to it, you're you're home free, like on the waterfront. Yeah. Like or on the on the footage front. Yeah. Waterfront. I just watched that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so now you have all these tapes coming in, right? Yeah. And uh yeah, I mean it was a really like it, my first job I have to say was super professional. They had like a writer's room area. They had a bunch of writers that were writing all the VO for this. Oh with ten million viewers a week you can yeah. afford that yeah. kind of stuff. Yeah. 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 with a tape librarian and you go check in check out the footage they had a research department they had a full post-production department mm -hmm. and production so i was a pa then i became an assistant coordinator then a coordinator and then i was friends with one of the post soups um he saw me like i was throughout my whole life as a you know from pretty much when i was a teenager till now i've done some kind of like programming on the side just for shits and giggles to automate some of my own stuff uh, recently. That's a hell of a skill. That's not an easy skill to like figure out. It, it's not, but it's not hard either. And it's much easier than it's ever been. Uh, we, I took some classes, so I hadn't programmed in a while. So I took these Python classes, programming classes with this company. I think they were called, they were originally called CoRise and then they changed their name to Uplimit. 
Did they have like some like 12 week boot camp or something? It was like a four week boot camp. Yeah. But what was awesome about it is like these were like industry pros that were teaching the classes. So like I took this Python class because there's a woman on Twitter that I followed, Pamela Fox, who's like a big advocate of Python programming language and has, has done a bunch. And I taken, I like looked at one of her things that she had had up before and I thought she was an awesome teacher. So I was like, you know, I want to get back into this. And Python seemed like the right language because it's kind of the de facto machine learning language for the time being. It's kind of the AI language for the time being. Um, so I was like, all right, it's in the wheelhouse of the things I want to do. And I took the class and absolutely loved it. Um, she was teaching it with a TA by the name of, I think, Mortaza Ali. And they were just great. You know, you're working in a group environment, small class, like 10, 20, maybe 30 people. And you get you know, lecture and you have homework and projects every week. And it was hard, but awesome. And I think anyone who, even if you don't have like programming experience and you're interested, like find one of these courses, it doesn't have to necessarily be this one in particular, um, and just do it mm -hmm. because you'll find that there's so much you can do to help you that you may not realize will help you like to just automate and simplify things on the back end, depending on whatever job you do. It's a whole different way of like thinking, right? Really like, cause is. my friend Thomas, um, who, who, who was here just last yeah. week, um, he, he did like a, uh, like a coding boot camp for mm -hmm. 12 weeks. And he was just like, I was the, he would be, I, I, I think I'm quoting him or paraphrasing him. He basically was, he was not the best student mm -hmm. in the class, right? but he was, but it's so easy to recognize the people who think Mm -hmm. in code yeah like he goes like there was one guy in the class and he could think the way you would have to code things whereas he would have to think and then translate it into code and he said he was way behind and it was really hard for him but he got through it and did it and then it ended up leading to a job which was great that's awesome but he but he said like within the class it was so easy to identify like the kids that had been doing this since they were like 12 yeah and you know he was like he's my age so he was like i think he was in his late 30s or early 40s when yeah. he was trying to do it and he just like it was a real uphill battle for him. Yeah. But but identifying the kids that had been doing it since they were young, mm -hmm. it's night and day. Yeah. 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 But, but I mean that kind of thinking that's just like engineering thinking, right? Like it's you basically looking at a problem, breaking it out into its modular pieces, right? And then you're designing the pieces that will do the the part that they need to do to make the thing that you want to do. I studied political philosophy. <laughs> What would Machiavelli think right now? Yeah, yeah, I mean, lost philosophy is actually probably uh, useful in AI safety. Yeah, probably in you in AI safety. Yeah, but it gets you gets you following politics way too much, which is just depressing. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, awesome. So I think that's really interesting because um, a lot of people who don't who don't go into university mm -hmm. for filmmaking mm -hmm. don't always end up in filmmaking. Like a lot of like it's it's a tough transition to make yeah. to get into this business without it having either a family member in it mm -hmm. or without having um, some kind of degree behind you. Yeah, it it is, and I feel like it's really again, like I said, when I say I'm lucky, you know, I, I'm maybe being it's a bit of an understatement because I feel like it's super hard to become an editor having not gone down some path. Um, but like I said, I was you know I did the AE thing for a few years after that initial job where I learned about Munster cheese. Um, and, you know, I got to a point at that, at that time when I was doing the AE job, I had a software company with the person who took interest in me, who gave me my first AE job, who was a post soup. And he was like one of those guys who thought in code, right? Like they just like programming and it was difficult for him to do, to get to that point. But it started programming when he was a child with, you know, the early Apple computers and HyperCard and things like that. Um, so he took interest in me and that you know, we started a little, uh, basically post-production workflow software company. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. yeah. We actually got it onto Extreme Makeover Home Edition. It was their kind of back end for, we had this thing called digital delivery. So this was 2005 and we were exporting cuts, digitizing them, sending them out for the network to view. And when the network would get it and open it up, it would send us a message that it looked at it. Um, and it was doing stuff probably way earlier than, you know, this was like, way before frame IO kind of things, way before a lot of these workflow systems. Um, and actually we ended up getting invited up to Apple to show them our software. Oh, that's cool. When they were looking for, uh, I don't know if you remember before final cut moved to final cut 10, it was final cut studio. And they had kind of this workflow software that I think they bought from a company in England. 
before they made that purchase, they were looking at different companies. We, we went up there and showed them our stuff. And obviously the company in England's stuff was way better because they ended up picking them up. But it was a really cool experience to go up there. And I actually think um, my old business partner is actually working at Apple now. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. yeah. That's wild. Yeah. Wild to, have, story. to have Apple be looking at your startup, mm-hmm. you know, for, for film and television workflow production. I think I think AI is going to change a lot of workflow production. I mean, it already has. Absolutely. For me, like I know that there's AI tools out there now for like podcasters yeah. to do um, cleaning of the audio mm-hmm. and you just upload your clip and 10 minutes later you download a clean version of it and yeah. it's all done um, with artificial intelligence. I don't even know how how they do it, but you just pull it back off and it's done. Yeah. yeah. Wild. Yeah. I mean, it's crazy. We used to pay like 40 bucks, 50 bucks an hour for transcriptions, right? Like reality TV would die if we didn't have transcriptions. Like, oh yeah, for sure. Yeah. how we yeah. tell our stories, right? Um, so it's it's really interesting because now, you know, for the stuff that I do on the side, I use this company, Assembly AI, and just part of their API. And, you know, it costs me 90 cents to do a transcription now, yeah. you know, for an hour, maybe even less than that. I have not looked at their prices yet for in a, quite some time. I remember because I I was uh, I made TV internationally, right? So I never really made it in the U.S. market yeah. uh, to any degree, really. But I was always kind of delivering to the international market, mm-hmm. and you always had to have an English transcript of the show. Yeah. Um, and then uh, and then they would uh, translate the English transcription mm-hmm. into Russian and Korean and 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 all the local languages. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And I remember like the first time we, this was like 2010, right? The first time we had to do a transcription, we're like, what the fuck are you doing, right? And then we found one of these kind of like AI sites that was able to, like you just upload the audio file yeah, and then you get a transcription back. And there were always a few mistakes that you had to fix, yeah. but I know that shit is much cleaner and much faster like now. 90 plus percent now. Yeah. I feel like before, probably when you were doing it, it was probably like 75% right. And then 25% words that you'd have to go through and kind of change the words and stuff yeah. but i feel like now you're easily punching above 90 90 some odd percent yeah. and it's getting it's getting like you know there's so much you could do with large language models and te- and and tv in general because you know it's less about the visuals especially with docs and unscripted but like a lot about the words right and ai already understands words like large language models take in massive amounts of tokenized you know, uh, text. And so they, you can create tools using large language models now to help you do the things that you need to do without them being multimodal tools. Like it doesn't necessarily need to know about the visuals and the videos, just things, the audio really to do like 75, 80% of what you need done. So when you say that, like when you say about docs and, and nonfiction content mm-hmm. and having the words be so, are you talking about like the narration of the story? The narration of the story, the in-scene dialogue. So basically the dialogue, like before, before it's like, you know, if you go out and shoot some stuff, like before you would go and like do your VO to kind of open a scene or something like that, just like whatever happens in scene, like all of those words get transcribed and you can do a multitude of things Mm -hmm. with that information. It's just, I think a lot of people, when they think about, you know, every, if you're on Twitter or X or whatever it's called, there's a whole, you know, I follow a lot of AI people on there. Um, professors, people like, uh, you know, head of Meta's AI, Jan LeCan, a um, lot of PhDs. And it's it's really interesting. Like, I don't understand m- almost any of the math that goes into what makes this stuff work the way that it does. And I feel I don't like, understand anything about math. Yeah. I, I mean, I would, I would love to. Like, I would love to. Like, now I have a better idea of the things that interest me. And if, you know, if I won the lottery tomorrow, I'd probably, like, get a tutor and try to go back to school. Um but it's it's really interesting. I feel like you're gonna see like a plethora of tools start dropping in the next in months, probably. I think a lot of times we're all focused on video generation because the tools like Dolly that do the image generation, uh, Mid Journey, these things are so cool because it's like all of a sudden you're creating these insane imagery out of a uh, text prompt, right? Mm-hmm. And I feel like a lot of people are looking like, oh, well, that's what where we're gonna go with, with video. It's just like. You prompt in a uh, man walking down street uh, in New York and it's hazy and all of a sudden you have a movie, you come out the other side and that's just not the way it works, right? Because like, again, you're only going to get so far if you're just prompting things, right? Like, but if you know how to make film, if you know how to tell a story, 
and then you use these tools, like you can actually, one person can do what four or five people were able to do. I'm really excited to see how it changes uh, the animated films and stuff like that. Because I mean, like obviously with like ChatGPT, for example, yeah. you can type in like woolly mammoth walking in snow mm -hmm. and you can get a picture of like a, an extinct woolly mammoth mm -hmm. walking in a snowy, you know, picture that kind of looks like Montana oh. or Southern, you know, Canada or the Rocky Mountains or something like that. And how far are we from taking that still image mm -hmm. and having it be like two woolly mammoths walk through a snowy mountain valley for 10 seconds I'm gonna and then have that and then and then have it create that that mm -hmm. AI generated animation yeah and you've basically done it with a few keystrokes yeah. instead of you know a whole lab of people who are really smart yeah you know working I mean, around the clock open AI is doing that now with their Sora model I don't know if you've seen any haven't on that no. but yeah check that out because that's like, they're doing that today um, I feel like it's a private beta or it's not open to the public yet. Um, there was a really cool project I saw that came out of like, so, you know, Alibaba, you're familiar with them, obviously. Yeah, of course. I, I got a chance to photograph Jack Ma, oh, the, the yeah. CEO, quite a few times because okay. I was working at the same time when Ali, you know, Alibaba was rising. But yeah, that's China's awesome. largest e-commerce and everything company. Yeah. So they have a research division that is doing a lot of machine learning and AI stuff. And they released um, some tech, I feel like last week. And I was, it was showing it to someone, but it takes a still image and then turns it into a bit moving video. So I think the, one of the examples that I saw that was, uh, what is the actress's name from like breakfast at Tiffany's Arch Audrey, is that Audrey Hepburn? No, 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 no. It's, um, is it Audrey Hepburn? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Audrey Hepburn was in breakfast at Tiffany's. What am I thinking? Breakfast. I'm thinking of breakfast club. I'm, I'm like, I'm like a decade off. Yeah. I'm thinking of like Rob Lowe and yeah, yeah, yeah. And Emilio Estevez. Yeah. Yeah. So there was a great, uh, they had this awesome project that they did where they had a still image of her and then they basically were able to animate this to make it look like a moving video from that still frame. That, and it wasn't her whole body. It was just that view. But man, I was like, that is very cool. Yeah. Um, but again, it's, it's, it's the magic's going to happen when the people who know how to really leverage these tools, um, get their hands on this stuff i think yeah and yeah it's 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 gonna happen you know because yeah. i was listening to um you know the musician lord mm -hmm. she was like super famous like 10 years ago she she came out with a few songs and uh i, I was listening to her on an interview i think it maybe it was with howard stern or maybe with joe rogan or something like that and everyone was asking like you know how many people she has in her band and, and you know how she travels and how she makes her music and actually everything that she did in her songs was synthesized and she was able to basically be like on her own with a keyboard and some kind of synthesizer machine and she was able to pretty much make all her music by herself yeah and 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 now like 10 years later i think that's where filmmaking is going to start to go like obviously the marvel movies and the mission impossibles you know they'll all have big budgets they'll all still use real people but the 16 or the 18 year old sitting at home with a creative mind for $10 a month or $20 a month will have tools available to them where they can probably make like a graphic novel and yeah. turn it into a film on their own Absolutely. using AI. Absolutely. And you know, is that bad? Good. I, is that I taking jobs from people? I have no idea. Yeah. I don't, I don't, yeah. I think it's great. Yeah. I don't, I don't think it's taking jobs from people, but I do think jobs will go away. Change for sure. Absolutely. Like, I feel like, you know, especially like if we're doing, talking about uh, reality TV, for instance, like just with what AI is capable of now, you could probably see, I can probably start seeing a lot of supporting roles go away, like story producers that kind of generate these initial sequences that editors work off of, which would be super sad for me because like, I love working with my story producers. I love having the back and forth with them or saying, hey, look, look at this. What do you think works? Does this work? Is this, you know? Or storyboarding. Yeah. 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 You know, so I feel like a lot of that is probably going to go away. Mm. You know what I mean? Because you'll be able to have uh, an AI generate, an AI agent of sorts generate a multitude of different sequences, getting uh, various emotions, maybe swapping out words. You know, especially like, you know, we're, re re we're restructuring stories constantly. So like what was an act one is now an act four. And that just causes a ripple effect, you know, in terms of story, right? Mm. 
I mean, having an agent, an AI agent, be able to give you a multitude of versions of that with different people, it completely changes the game. It frees up a lot of resources. Um, but budgets are already getting smaller on shows. You know what I mean? Forever. Like, yeah. Because yeah. yeah. no one's no one's doing 20 million on a Sunday afternoon anymore. Nobody. No one. Just Mr. Beast. Just <laughs> Mr. Beast. I think he lets out, I think he puts out one one video a month, right? See? Yeah. Okay. And he gets like he's yeah, gets like two hundred million views yeah. or something like that. Yeah, I feel like it's a little bit like the Wild West. I don't think anyone really knows where it's gonna go and what it's gonna be like. I really don't think through the networks with all of their metrics and focus groups know what's gonna happen and then they're rolling with the punches like everybody else. I think their disadvantage is that they're much bigger. Yeah. So for change to happen, it just takes long, yeah. right? Which means someone's going to beat them out. Exactly. And so it's going to, it's just going to diffuse more eyeballs yeah. into other locations. Yes. Yeah. Smaller, leaner teams. You know, I, I'm a big proponent of it. I know, you know, the more you can do as an individual, because oftentimes when I'm working on a show, I'll get pulled aside and maybe I'll, maybe I'm a little stronger on motion graphics. So I'll go do some more of that. I think the more stuff you know how to do, the better. And I feel like the more you're able to leverage all of these tools, the better. And I think if you're not leveraging them, you should start thinking about it seriously. Like the days of you just being like, oh, I'm not the flash editor. I'm not the this person. I just do story. Well, everyone does story. Yeah. And I think, and I think, and I think like people, I think directors are going to start hiring. Like we, I, we had a nickname for them, like Jackknife post-production people. <laughs> Who, you know, you, you, I'm an editor, I'm a producer, producer, yeah. I'm a... Yeah, we call them predators, predators, which is a terrible name. They're like like oh, Arnold Schwarzenegger predator? Yeah, they're like, we're looking for predators. I'm like, what well, like names? Uh, that yeah, can get you in a lot of trouble. Yeah. Uh, producer, editor. Yeah. Uh, we're looking for Harvey Weinstein type. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, we have the joke in our business, uh, yeah. you know, I have a couple of editors, friends that we talk about, like, you know, there's different types of us, like, I'll... You know, there's people who just like whittle stuff away, just remove, 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 slap some music on it, and they're done. And then there's people who like go in and construct. Mm -hmm. And I feel like I would think it's better to be of the constructing type as opposed to just the removing and slapping music on it type. Absolutely. So, look, how did you go from being a PA with your dirty fucking shoes <laughs> on that white stage, yeah. getting shit on by the director, yeah. to to having someone trust you with editing? Because that's like a that's a big leap. Yeah, it's a lot of, it was a lot of, a uh, lot of late nights. Mm -hmm. A lot, I worked, I did a lot of AA work at night. Like uh, after other work? Like, no, or what were you? Like my shift was a night shift. So oh, shit, back really? in the day, they used to, they don't do it so much anymore, but, you know, shows were like 24 seven. So you'd have a full day team and then you'd have like a night squad that would come in at like 5 PM and work to like two or four. And you guys would do the post-production on what they shot that day. Not necessarily. You would just take over for whatever, wherever they left off at night because you're trying to hit these schedules that like. They had two post-production teams working, working in yeah, like 10 normal. or 12 hour shifts. Yeah. This was normal. This was a normal thing. Like you had your day crew and then a lot of times you would have night crews come in. And oftentimes a lot of those dudes were double dipping, right? And it was like known. It wasn't a secret. And they would show up and this was like their second job. And they, you know, they're probably making bank. But um, no life, no life. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of, yeah. I knew a couple of editors that, you know, had to go to rehab and stuff like that. That's par for the court. Yeah, actually. actually. <laughs> um, I remember, I remember I was, I was watching an interview with uh, James Franco mm. and he's a very interesting guy, obviously actor, writer, producer. Um, but he went uh, somewhere in his career. He was kind of feeling like he needed more mm. and he went to back to New York and he went to NYU. And, and he wanted to like actually learn filmmaking like from a 360 degree point of view because mm -hmm. obviously he got his big break with like Freaks and Geeks and mm -hmm. and uh, and that whole team, Seth Rogen, and they all kind of came up together, which was amazing. And then he got a whole bunch of big movie roles early, right? Mm -hmm. And I think, anyways, there was at some point where he like wanted to go back to school. and But he was saying that he went back to New York and then he got caught up, I think, in, in doing a daytime soap opera. Mm -hmm. And he was doing like General Hospital or something like that. I, I, I really want to check this and get it right. But he, and he was telling me of the production schedule. Oh, it's insane. like, they, they, yeah, they were doing like a full episode every like day and a half. Yeah. And when you tell me about like having two shifts of editors, mm -hmm. you know, editing like 18 hours a day, two nine hour shifts, I'm thinking of like him, like uh, having to read. I think he told me he was, re he had to perform 
like 40 or 50 pages of script like in a day or two yeah and it was and it was and they were doing almost like a full like 60 minute episode every two days yeah he said the pace was unbelievable but but it got him to the point where he could memorize everything no problem and then actually when he finished that and he finished nyu he came back out to la and he did his first read through for a for um for a director for a, for a role mm -hmm. and he just remembered like how easy it was to like memorize the lines yeah. and he gave it to the director like four or five different ways yeah and and the director was just totally impressed because he only had the material for like 10 minutes yeah but of course he had this huge training that he, he i think he did that I, I think he did that for like a whole season like i think it was like eight months he was doing wow. at that pace um and it was, it's a great story if anyone can find it yeah i mean it's one of those open secrets that you know was always told to me is like some of the best people in the biz come from that side of things the soap operas like you wouldn't you know, if you're if it's not your jam, it's real easy to just write them off. Yeah. But there's like super skilled, talented people just knocking shit out. It's, it's just a grind. Yeah. I think like I think it's like our industry is such a grind. Yeah. And there's so much that goes on behind the scenes that the viewers don't get to see. Mm -hmm. And if you can kind of get comfortable with that grind at an early age mm -hmm. and get into you know production and and get comfortable with that, yeah, like the sky's the limit. Because by the time you're like forty or fifty you know, and you're doing much higher paid jobs mm -hmm. and you have much more responsibility, you know, you learn all those lessons in the early days and mm -hmm. they do carry you through because everything does get a little bit easier. And especially as technology makes things yeah. easier. It's, um, it's a real blessing to have like those, those grinding early jobs. Yeah. And I definitely had more than my fair share of that. I mean, when I was doing the AE stuff, uh, before I moved to, you know, doing daytime AE stuff, I was also doing like the software thing during the day. So we had computers we would rent out and go drop off servers at places during the day. And I remember carrying, uh, I don't know if you remember, Apple used to make this computer called the EMAC. I don't know. It came at the end of the iMac range. And it was like their educational Mac that was slightly cheaper, had a flat screen, was like a white kind of transparent body. Way to fucking touch. I bet, yeah. How, how many of those have you carried? Oh my God, so many. It, it weighed so much. I remember one night, when I I was going into my a, a nighttime AE shift, having dropped off like two Emacs out of my station wagon, carrying them in the rain, and I'm just be like, hope this just pays off one day. Yeah, and uh, it has. I'm super grateful for it. But yeah, it's there's a lot of if you want to do this, there's going to be a ton of opportunities to quit. Oh, for sure. Yeah, yeah. and you just got to make sure. I just never took any of them. Yeah, I had I had a. I had an actor I was chatting with the other day and he had a great line. He's like, the moment you stop doing it, the dream is done, right? Yeah. So so as long as you don't quit, you're still in it mm -hmm. and the dream is still alive. And that's something. Yeah. Like everyone comes out here, you know, maybe they have early success, maybe they have later success, maybe they have no success. But the moment you stop, the dream is done. Yeah. Right. And then and then it's over for good. Yeah. And and he and he just never let himself like let the dream go and sometimes he wouldn't work for six months and he had other jobs and he was he was a waiter i think at, at you know in between in between work um but he just said like no matter what like as long as the dream is alive yeah. I'm, a, I'm ahead yeah as he basically like indoctrinated himself with that mentality mm -hmm. and, it, and it paid off i mean he got into social media and stuff because the gaps between work um was was too great yeah and now he has a very nice steady social media business where he's mm -hmm. making great money but but yeah, acting and performing was his first love, right? Mm -hmm. And and he's just like, I'm not, I can't let that go. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. I mean, it's one of those things. Like, how lucky are we? Like, you know, even if if I work on uh, a show that the content may not be like my jam, like I may not watch watch it once it airs. Celebrities fixing their car, yeah, whatever. I, I'd watch that one. <laughs> uh, that's my pet peeve. It's just like celebrities doing everything that I don't want to watch them do. Like, you know, yeah, the car thing, because that's another like I love working on cars and, and I have a little little car that I work on. So I totally watch celebrities working on cars. I just make a Lego car. <laughs> yeah, but it's one of those things like, you know, I, I feel like um, you should just take the opportunities, you know, as they come up and, and, and grind it out because someone else will. Yeah, you don't. It's true. So so back again, like we got a little sidetrack. So how did you actually go from being like a PA a, pri a personal assistant that to having someone trust you with editing anything because yeah. that's because you don't have a you don't have a degree in it no so i, I you know where did that trust gap how did you jump that trust gap so that trust gap was like a 
I'd say probably like four to five year gap mm -hmm. before that actually happened. So like I was a PA probably for six months and then became an assistant coordinator for like another six months. Then I was a coordinator probably for a year. And then I got a super lucky break in that they were looking for assistant editors. They couldn't find them. Um, so my friend who I ended up having a software company with later on, uh, this gentleman by the name of Josh Paul, he gave me my, my break and basically said, come in over the weekend. We have this, our lead AE, uh, Yuko, she's going to teach you everything she knows about that. She can teach you in two days on how to digitize tapes. And then on Monday, I'm just going to start you like, oh, so, wow. Yeah. So, so you got to learn on the job. I, I learned on the two days before my job started. That's epic. <laughs> that, yeah. And I tried to learn as much, but I had no, having not gone to film school, when she was teaching me about the bins and sequences and like clips, like just, I didn't understand the terms because I never went to film school. I didn't know what a film bin was. You know what I mean? It has its whole, it has its whole own dictionary. Like, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it's like, you know, you get all of that stuff. And the first show that I AE'd on, American High, we were actually like the digitizers because the show was run in a way where every editor had their own assistant editor and they were actually doing with the story. We were more like technical assists. So these, so these, these were shot in film uh, and you had to, and you had to digitize them or you had to take them on video, but they were, they were shot on, on beta or something. When we, I don't know which version of beta we were shooting or digi beta, or maybe it was XD cam. And you had to convert them into something that you could put yeah. through final cut. So we had a, we had a deck and it would go through media composer, avid media composer. Okay. And then, so I did that. I started getting a string of editing, uh, assistant editing jobs, like on game shows. I worked on a show with Card Sharks for, for a little while. That was super fun. Um, stage shows are great as an assistant editor because like when you're, you know, you have like five or six cameras, right? But you really only need to log the one, which is like the line cut. And then you just have the, uh, the other tapes batch did. So after you log that one, you just like read a book or, you know, mm -hmm. did whatever while the other ones were ditching. So there was a lot of free time and I would spend my free time just kind of playing around on one of the Abbots, right? Because you had a multitude of them and when you were on your shift, they were usually all free. Um, so they weren't live cutting the game shows? Yeah. They live cut them on stage to a line cut and then we would get the line cut and then all the ISO cams. And then we would log the line cut, but then you'd export that log out as a text file and then change the tape number name and then re-import it into a bin and then batch dig those clips. I understand half of what you just said. <laughs> there's like, there's some old guy at home be like, I remember that time. Like, none, of the, none of the kids now would understand. I mean, it's all basically the same, but like they didn't have the digitization process no. to deal with, which is what we had to do. And you were digitizing at a, at a low, low, low resolution, like 1 20th of what the resolution of the file was because disk space was super expensive. Still is. Yeah. Yeah. Way cheaper though. Yeah. I, mean, I, I even remember going from like 1080p to 4K yeah. and being like, Fuck. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, and the problem for us was, um, was, uh, not necessarily like your home storage or your office mm -hmm. storage, uh, which was, you know, fairly easy to get cheap, some um, static hard drives, you know, for your home office or whatever. But, uh, but in the field, mm -hmm. we needed way more memory. Yeah. And those memory cards back in the day, we were using those Sonys and they had their own memory cards. Yeah. Not like the, not like the, the, the cards that are kind of like in the red or whatever they have. Yeah. And, uh, I just remember those PC MCIA cards or something like that. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but they were so expensive and yeah. they, and they weren't, um, and they weren't big enough. And then of course we would go out on these like 14 day shoots and we wouldn't download. So we would go out with, with. Um, a generator, we would have batteries, you know, but we would, what we would go out with is we would go out with a stack of like 50 cards oh. and we would have, you know, numbers on all of them. And then we would shoot one kind of log, you know, um, card one, mm -hmm. you know, day one, half of day two, whatever. And then we would get back off out of the field because it was just too hard. Like you're walking like 20 miles a day in the desert. You don't want to wipe one of those cards and like, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, you shoot the card, put it away, tape it, you know, tape it. It had its own little plastic case, you know, tape the case so no one can reuse it. Yeah. Put it in the done bin, you know, make a little note of what might be in there. Workflow. Yeah. yeah. yeah you in the that, field. That workflow. If he didn't have the workflow, yeah. do we get messed up a lot? I just remember those cards being so fucking, and we could have saved so much money if we just downloaded every yeah. day, but we were just not in the mood and. It was so hard to bring a laptop out there and like it was so dusty and up in the mountains it was too much. 
So we would just go out for 14 days, shoot batteries, cards, everything in one go, and then come back and like figure it all out. Not normally. Yeah. Balls of steel. Well, don't tell B- <laughs> don't tell BBC we used to work like that because I think they figured I think they thought we were a little bit more like systematic. Yeah. But it, you couldn't be done any other way. Yeah. Yeah. And then I think like the logistical the logistics of what we did made what we did quite special. Like yeah. I think um, a lot of people go out and do adventure stuff, but we really like went to some really far off places. That's crazy. And I think because we had that like in field workflow figured out, mm-hmm. we were able to get to places where a lot of like broadcast partners wouldn't go unless they had you know millions of dollars and they could set up like tents and like little cities in the mm-hmm. middle of the desert to do like an amazing race or something. But we, were you guys also, would you say like you guys were doing like every person was doing more than one person's job? Oh, of course. Yeah. 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 It was just the three of us. Yeah. So it would be, so I was the producer, director and host. So I would pick the locations. I would research it. I'd pick the routes. I'd find the guides. I would do all that kind of stuff. And then, cause I loved it. Like I loved doing that. Mm-hmm. Like I would sit out at night, you know, with my laptop and a, and a glass of whiskey and I would dream up like, where's a really fucked up, cool place to go visit? Okay, Papua New Guinea. Yeah. Okay, treks in Papua New Guinea. Mountains you can climb in Papua New Guinea. Yeah. And then I would come up with like four or five things, and then I would do more research, and then I would find a guide, and then I would interview the guide, you know, by Skype or Zoom, um, and then I would say, okay, that's going to be one. And then I I would do that. So for each season of like Extreme Treks, which was eight episodes, I would have like twelve episodes prepped, mm-hmm. and then. And then I would cut it back to eight based on how hard it was to get filming permits. Mm-hmm. Because um, obviously you're traveling around with lots of gear. You know, we had like, I don't know, $30,000 worth of camera equipment that we would mm-hmm. slog around the world. And and uh, you got to go through customs. You got to get permits and everything like that. And I just remembered like any country where they made it too difficult to film, I would just like walk away. Because it was just too much. Like, yeah. it, like in some countries, they tried to charge us like a $15,000 film permit, which was just ridiculous. Yeah. Um, uh, as an independent production, we can never afford that. You should have just given them two of your uh, cards. Be like, these are worth fifteen thousand. <laughs> back in the day, <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I used to just cut it back based on like how difficult the government was going to be. Okay, and now like I, because I wanted difficult treks, I wanted things in the middle of nowhere, but they had to want us to be there at least. Yeah, like they didn't have to pay us to be there. Yeah, but I, I couldn't deal with like red tape. That just yeah. made my mind. Yeah. It was too much for me. That makes sense. Yeah. I mean, it's too much, especially when you have a crew of three and everyone's wearing multiple hats. Wait. Well, it was fun because we were like a real team, right? Like yeah. we did everything together. Like there was obviously a hierarchy, but we gelled really well. We worked together for like seven or eight years, like just the three of us in the field, like 250, 300 yeah. days a year. And it was, it was beautiful. See, it goes back to the, the, who you work with. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like I, you, that first editing job that I had, Extreme Makeover Home Edition, was I just had awesome people and they were all way more senior than me in terms of just their experience their life experience i think i was like 24 at the time um got to get a couple of alcoholics in there with yeah. a few divorces to tell you how life really is going to be like absolutely yeah and they were the best editors you leave here yeah the bitter old men <laughs> and women and women yeah. yeah um yeah so it was you know i think getting that initial break getting someone to trust me was really just a matter of you know we had a great guy who's a phenomenal editor this guy named mike malloy who was kind of leading our post team on that show in particular the executive producer is this guy who's super famous uh tom foreman i don't know if you heard of him but um, you know he's been doing it forever really talented guy um and he you know malloy i remember going to malloy and be like you know i want to do this and he was very much like a story rhythm person you know he's a musician so he has that background He's a very feel guy. He's how many good how many good editors are musicians? I feel like all of them. Yeah. On some level, if they're not, they're they're an artist. They paint. Yeah. Or maybe they like, you know, they sew or they do some other thing that's also creative and tactile. And they bring that influence into the post. I Charles from yeah. skills, yeah. I think. Yeah. Totally. All the guys I worked with all had some other kind of like musical or some kind of other background where they were able to bring in that rhythm into the show. It makes it makes such a huge difference. And I feel like when you're working with people that will, you know, and it, it happens a lot. I think you just got to stick your neck out and say, Hey man, this is what I want to do. I think I want to do this because it is a commitment. You know, like I, I feel like making that jump from an AE to an editor, um, there's, that's going to be like, you're guaranteed, like you're signing on to a half decade of just grind. You know what I mean? And maybe you're super like lucky and like, you're not signing on to that and like, you're going to become an editor and everything's going to be great. And you're going to be on a show for 10 seasons and awesome for you. Um, but you're figuring so much of it out, but it's really like getting someone to trust you. Just ask them for stuff to cut. 
You know what I mean? Go ask. Like I started asking editors before I went to Malloy. I'd be like, hey man, do you have something for me to do? Be like, um, I'm like behind the ball on the scene. You want to start putting together this tease for the end of this act? Do it. Absolutely. You know I mean? Like coming up next episode. Absolutely. Yeah. And and there's I there's a there's people that I work with that were assistant editors who were like, Oh, I don't want to edit if I'm not getting paid to edit. It's like if I'm not paid as an editor, if I'm not getting recognized, it's like, but you're not. Mm-hmm. You're an assistant. They're the fucking editors and mm-hmm. you're here and they're there. So figure out how to segue this gap. And for me, it was, I, I liked doing it. You know what I mean? Like I actually love the craft of editing. Like it doesn't matter. I feel like for me, I've worked on shows that I've not been into the content. So I get lost in the craft of what I'm doing. That's an interesting way to, you know, yeah, it's just a way to work on it. I, I appreciate looking at the material. I, I love learning about like, you know, you, you become like, when you edit, you pick up on all these little micro expressions. Like how can I use this to amplify that? How can I use this to tell that story? So it's like, that's what I would get lost in. Mm-hmm. Um, just the creative part that was completely detached from whatever content we were doing. And I feel like that's where I got most of my growth most of my growth as an editor, as a creative storyteller happened was when I stopped being like, am I on the best show that's right for my career? Am I, is this getting me enough union hours? Am I, do I have my health care cover? Like, you know what I mean? And I don't have children. So it's like super easy for me to not think about that stuff. And, and yeah, you get to think about yourself. Yeah. Amazing. Isn't it? <laughs> it's wonderful. <laughs> yeah. And I have a lot of friends who have, you know, three, four kids and they live in LA and you know, that union health care is phenomenal that you you know you're not paying two thousand dollars a month for life changing yeah you're paying 200 Mm. you know what i mean so it's i think it's awesome for a lot of people did you see the thing with seth rogan today in the news he's something about his million in advance smoking weed and how much he loves uh, a childless life (laughs) he came out as like his wife and him don't want to have kids like he gets and he he was like why he's like it just doesn't seem fun yeah he goes my wife and i wake up at noon on saturday we smoke weed we order some pizza we watch movies like he goes, I'm the only one of my friends that does that because I don't have any kids. And he yeah. goes, it's wonderful. That's awesome. I watch, I watch like his Instagram of him, like uh, he like sculpts things, ashtrays. Yeah, he makes ashtrays. hot so, ashtrays. Yeah, at I'm home. And they're watching him. I'm like, dude, he's he's good. I follow him too. It's yeah. amazing. He smokes a joint, makes an ashtray, w- waits for it to dry, ashes out in it. He does. He makes one almost every day. He's a whole stoner ecosystem. He is <laughs> a beautiful, beautiful human <laughs> being. I think. Yeah, he's he's epic. I remember those first. You remember Super Bad? When he plays the cop, the cop with um, Bill Hader, who's constantly looking for semen everywhere, like that was the joke, right? Like if there were semen, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. that was McLovin. Yeah, uh, that was a fucking legend. Uh, love it, love it, so good. So, so where I mean, like, where are you now in your career? Um, you know, you've you've come through. You've probably done every job in the post production sphere, mm-hmm. which is which is amazing. You could probably just jump in to do anything at any time you know where are you now what are you working on like what do you where where are you taking all of this skill and experience you've got you know I just feel like all the things adding up to you know all the years in post all the years focusing on workflows the python programming the you know the deep learning classes I feel like all of it's going to probably amount to some kind of tool building at some point straight to marvel as a director (laughs) (laughs) they need me Yeah. yeah Um, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I, I'm loving the editing. Um, I do program and, and I am constantly thinking of tools. I think the big problem I have with a lot of production and post-production tools is that they're all the same mm-hmm. in that the interface is the issue. Right? It's terrible. The UX is off. No, 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 all the stuff. No one wants this. I don't want to ch- click boxes. I don't want to wait for a round trip loop for something to go out to a server. And I sit there twiddling my thumbs when I had all this like momentum going, right? Cause like momentum is huge at editing. R- rhythm's like, everything. Like my process is like, I'll spend, I'll watch everything, right? Get a feel. I'll talk to people like, what is this supposed to feel like? The actual editing of stuff is a lot less time the prepping to edit the thinking about the music thinking about what the mood is like getting all of the stuff like what's said getting all the pieces rearranged in my head i'll do all of that before i cut one yeah that's that's actually very interesting like david harris and uh well, or zach romeo two of my two editors one did extreme checks one did expedition mm-hmm. asia so they would tell me like it would take them about four weeks to put together a rough cut mm-hmm. and they're working by themselves mm-hmm. right so i would send them a hard drive from some far off country i would finish filming go straight to dhl or fedex send them a hard drive, but even before I went home. Mm-hmm. 
and uh and then they would get it and they told me like they would watch everything and make notes for like two or three weeks mm -hmm. go through all the dialogue go through all the live scenes all the drone footage everything like that make notes on what they liked blah 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 and then they would put the rough cut together in like a week mm -hmm. like and that's when they would like edit edit but the first little while it was all like note taking because you have to watch you have to watch everything yeah because you can't you can't miss if you care <laughs> if you care you and can. yeah you got to care um, and, um, but then when it came to the cutting, it actually wasn't that long because mm -hmm. they'd done so much prep. Yeah. yeah. And I feel like if you approach it that way, that's the way that I approach it. Obviously some things are different. If I'm stuck on something, I'll just try to start editing something else. Even if it's not meaningful, even if it'll never see the light of day, mm -hmm. um, just to get me past whatever is blocking me up. Yeah. You know what I mean? And it's just like doing something fun. But a lot of these things, like, I don't want to click more boxes. So when I think of like, what's the future of post look like with, uh, AI and all of these, uh, you know, kind of like new ways of looking at things. I feel like for me, technology, like the evolution of technology that I want to see in my life, in my world, is that all of this stuff falls to the background. You know what I mean? Like, I don't, I want it to all go away. I want all the screens to go away. I just want it to be so embedded in kind of the background of our life that it doesn't, it's not a thing that I have to interact with, right? Like the, I want the interaction to become more human. Do you, are you at a stage now, are you at a stage now in your career where you, where you want to edit new projects or where you want to change the way post-production is being done through, through your coding or through a computer company or through a That's partnership? A great question. I don't, I don't think I've ever like actually thought of it that way. Um, cause I don't want to do anything on that technical yeah. side of it. I just want to keep making stuff, right? Yeah. I think I definitely, I absolutely love editing and I think it's a, beautiful skill to know how to do but I feel like the natural progression that I'm seeing is I do see myself kind of moving more to the technology side and taking all of these kind of skills and knowledge that I have and transferring it over as a storyteller and an editor who doesn't want to be bogged down by the tools I think that's a huge statement because you know like even directors mm -hmm. have moved into technology creation like yeah. I just think of James Cameron right like mm -hmm. here's this world-class director Oscar winning blah 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 and he went out and started making his own cameras. He started making his own, you know, um, uh, you know, um, suits, you know, for Avatar and stuff like that. Like he was at the s forefront of actually building all that technology to make his the own stuff. Submarine too, you're near. Like I don't know if that was his own. Yeah. So he, yeah, he he was part of a team that put together this deep water sub that went down to the Mariana Trench. Yeah. yeah he's like a Rolex ambassador. Yeah. He gave a big talk at the Explorers Club in New York mm -hmm. at, right after he did it. There's like a little. Um, there's a little f American flag or Explorers Club flag that he took down oh, all the way to the oh. Mariana Trench. Yeah, he's like an honorary member or something I like bet. that. I yeah. bet. I bet. Yeah, it's it's really cool. And I feel like that's more of us should do this kind of thing, like try to cross over into the tech world, into the tech space, especially as tool builders. Yeah. Um, you know, I don't know if you're, you've seen that company Humane. They have that AI pin coming out. I haven't is, seen this. Yeah, look it up. It's a... Uh, their name is, I believe the founder's name is Imran Chaudhry. And uh, they have this AI assistant, which is like this little digital pin. I ordered mine the day that it dropped. I think it's supposed to ship at the end of the month. But it's like a, it's collect, it's connects to, it's basically a tiny device that's packed with a ton of tech. It has a laser ink display. So it like will shoot out instead of having an actual display like a phone that you take out. You just kind of stick your hand out and it just projects onto your hand. Oh, I've seen this. I saw this on Instagram or something. Yeah, yeah. I feel like those kind of, I'm really into that space of complete paradigm shifts in in these kinds of tools. Um, and I feel like there's a huge opportunity with something like that because it is kind of taking a step back, right? Like it's less in your face. It's kind of in the background. It's something that you communicate with. I think as a storyteller, one of the things that I would love is like if I was sitting down and, and editing on a project to communicate with a large language model that was listening to my sequence as opposed to me having to do an export of the sequence communicate with a model to say hey you know that part where she says this thing can you give me some alternates or can you get me some alternates from different characters um and have it like a lot like a live assistant that's kind of that, guiding that that is probably more i get it yeah that more like, in kind of the space that i think all technology should go well, you've been in it. You've been in it so long, right? Mm -hmm. So, like, if someone is going to change the space, and if someone is going to technologically advance and create tools that that editors and post production professionals can actually utilize, 
to streamline their jobs, it's going to come from someone who's been in it for 20 years like you. Yeah, it has to. Because some like some like 15 year old geek kid who can code the shit out of anything, he's not going to have the experience of what exactly a 40 year old editor who's been working on shows for 20 years yeah. needs. Yeah. Like they're just they're they, he just doesn't have the experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and I think we just really got to start thinking about how we interact with computers in a completely different way. You know what I mean? In the film and television space. In every space, really. Like, how, like, like there's got to be more to this interaction than just clicking on buttons on screen and, you know what I mean, and scrubbing video. So I think about, like, what are different ways? Like, how, how what are all the different ways that I want to interact with a piece of video, uh, a, a scene, like... You know, and I'll, and I'll stay up. This is how I fall asleep at night usually. Like, you know, trying to think of a new creative ways of what does that mean? What does that look like? Because I'm I'm really sick and tired of like drop down menus and having to scroll. And and like you said, and I don't want an engineer telling me. And God bless the engineers. I don't want them telling me how I should make stuff. You know what I mean? Sure. Yeah. I feel like that's what happens a lot of times. Is you like you said, people who are not don't have the experience are the toolsmiths. Yeah, and we actually need people who come from the world to make the tool because they're making all the wrong tools. Yeah, yeah. I think it's gonna. We're in it. We're all gonna end up like having our own Jarvis, like yeah. from Iron Man. Absolutely, like, we are. Like, uh, I mean, that's what that AI pin essentially is. Yeah, and it's Except right there in the middle of the chest as well. well. Very, very significant. I'm really interested. I feel like you have. There's probably a whole. I don't know what the like how many how long you could record, but there's got to be a ton of new content coming out with just kind of that perspective camera. Like, you know, I know GoPros and, and, you know, a lot of those, uh, D DJI, yeah. yeah, DJI cams uh, and the Osmo. Osmo and the, and the 360 cam. Yeah. They have like, um, uh, chest mounts and they have mm -hmm. like a little stick that goes up that as well that it like shoots all around, but you can't see the the stick actually holding it. Yeah. Like, there's a lot of advances like, yeah, I'm body curious. cams are huge. Absolutely. I'm yeah. curious to see if we're going to see like a new kind of new type of social content, you know, with that perspective kind of leading the way, leading the charge and story. For sure. I think it's going to be part of it, even live streaming, right? Like just having cameras on all the time and, and just, yeah, I think there's people already yeah. doing that. I, I think if some guy is making like half a million dollars a year, I think people watch him, uh, watch him sleep and things. You remember the Truman Show with uh, Jim Carrey, like that live streaming? Yeah. 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 It was great. I think we're all just going to be living in some version of the Truman Show at some stage. Maybe we already are. Maybe we already are. Don't unplug the me. Yeah. Uh, uh, don't unplug me from the matrix. Yeah. Right? No, that's kind of creepy. Yeah. Yeah, I think I like I said, I'm a I'm a tech optimist, and I feel like there's a there's a lot of good stuff to be excited about, and and I think for people who are like freaked out about AI and stuff like that, like we're a pretty long way from having to be freaked out about anything. Listen to some of the experts. Don't listen to people who sensationalize uh, the fears and dangers of AI. Um, but yeah, like I said, I'm an, I'm an optimist. I feel like technology will, will continue to help us. So, so you're editing, you're, you know, you're working your way through various jobs in post-production. You're obviously working a lot, which is great. Uh, March, 2020, what, what was it like kind of being a working, um, content creator, storyteller in this town, yeah. you know, when everything shut down for COVID? Cause everyone's got crazy COVID stories. Yeah. Like I was stuck in Ethiopia. When the world closed, I couldn't go back to Dubai. I was in the Simeon Mountains. Um, there was a civil war about to break out. Yeah, I mean, I, there's a lot of stuff going on. Crazy times, man. I, I'm so happy it's yeah, you know, behind us. Um, but yeah, it it was it was crazy because like you know our business just shut down. Were you working on a show during I feel that like time? I may have been cutting a sizzle or two. Yeah. Like I, I feel like I was definitely working at home. Well, you said you were well positioned for COVID because you'd already switched to working from home, yeah. which is great because you didn't have to go into the office. Yeah. Um, so I was working, but it was, it was, I think what the, the shocker for me was how much work dried up during and after COVID. Oh yeah. Like it, it really did kind of collapse a lot of stuff. And then even till today, yeah, even till today, I have people that, you know, I'm, I've been, like I said, super lucky but i have a lot of people that i get emails from like yo i'm looking for work and these are people that were working regularly for years and years yeah i just feel like a lot of this consolidation there's just a lot less money being spent and since one network you know has like a hundred under networks and you have kind of these big players like if the top network that the top of the, the the chart is not spending money nobody else underneath them is spending money no one's buying shows 
Um, it's true. Yeah. That, I, I, I've, I've talked to a lot of people in the, obviously in the creative space yeah. and a lot of people kind of are saying what you're saying is basically like COVID was miserable mm -hmm. and then the writer's strike was miserable yeah. and then the actor's strike was miserable. And it's like, now we finally have all that behind us. So like 2024 is going to be like the year. Yeah. yeah like, like, let's get a couple years under our belt where we can just fucking work yeah. without being distracted by garbage. Garbage yeah. being a global pandemic and some strikes. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I think the whole business has changed and I feel like it's kind of like the, the wild west again. And like, we're figuring it out, you know, like when reality came on the scene, it was a little bit of the wild west and that it changed the whole dynamic of well, and... well, reality came out of the last strike, mm -hmm. right? Cause like all the actors went on strike and then everyone just started watching the fucking Kardashians. And next thing you know, they're the biggest thing in the world and everyone wants to do reality TV. Yeah. So like, I'm curious what's going to come out of of this strike what's going to be the new trend yeah who knows man i mean i feel like covid and all of like short content is definitely a winner i know quibi tried to quibi uh quibi i still have a pitch from quibi i made a yeah, i made a pitch it was like um i feel like at some point everyone had a show at quibi well they were spending so much money at like okay. and and of course that was the thing right they just were gonna like you know overtake everyone by spending yeah you know hbo game of thrones style content yeah. five minute episodes yeah. go only on your phone only on your phone yeah and then everybody's at home now yeah it's it's <laughs> it's it was wild they they pulled the plug on that fast yeah yeah i was actually surprised it actually seemed like it kind of fumed out a little bit longer um yeah i never i never saw a quibi show i didn't have the app on my phone I think they released, like, Kevin Hart had a show okay. that they released, like, and he's obviously everywhere all the time, yeah. so of course he was on Quibi, like, first. Did they have, like, an Apple TV app, or did they not do any of that stuff, and they were just focused on mobile? I think they had their own app, okay. and I think, that, I don't even know if, I mean, I think they I think they launched the app, and then, like, two months later, it was done. Yeah. It's it's crazy. There's, I mean, there's people who come to, to try to innovate like that, and of course, you know, um, it's... It's interesting to see like how aggressive people can be in this space and how much money there is to allow people to be aggressive in this space. And that all that money doesn't necessarily mean you'll win. No, definitely not. <laughs> like, you know, it's probably going to, the, the thing that wins is probably going to come from some grassroots. Uh, definitely, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, yeah, I, th I, I think it's super exciting. Like, I'm, I'm curious to see what some young kid somewhere does with the tools that they have and, and, and what the next thing's going to be. I just hope that there's like, um, I just hope we kind of go back into some kind of like democratization of storytelling. Yeah. I think I was speaking with someone uh, a little while ago where I was saying like, you know, 10 or 15 years ago, someone would have like a $10 million production budget and give a million dollars to 10 producers mm -hmm. to create 10 different stories, Yeah, you know, fiction, nonfiction, whatever, whatever. And now that $10 million budget is just going into like one production with an A-lister. Mm -hmm. And of course, like that's completely affected my business too, because mm -hmm. I'm not an A-lister, right? But but I, but in some cases I could be one of those 10. Mm -hmm. So, so it's completely changed the way money is being circulated for storytelling. And then it's also affecting the way, you know, people view it because people aren't getting exposure to as many stories. Mm -hmm. And then again, all we're doing is watching A-list celebrities go to Italy and cook, fix cars, mm -hmm. you know, go rock climbing when they only show up for an hour once a week. You know, I mean, like these are things that are happening all around us and somehow they're being consumed, but I'm just wondering if the tide's going to shift back at all. It might not. It might not. No. But I feel like, I mean, is that, would you say like, is that a, a negative or is, do you think the fact that it wouldn't, is that an opportunity to do something else to create a new space just out of necessity? Well, I mean, if I was an A-list actor, I'd be super happy with it, right? Because yeah. like Zac Efron and, and, um, and what's his face, Thor, <laughs> um, you know, um, and Chris. Hemsworth Chris. and, uh, and Jason Momoa, like these guys can go back now. These guys can make three movies a year and then do two TV shows yeah. with Nat Geo or Discovery or something. Yeah. So it's great for them. Yeah. But, but what what about all of us that were kind of like working on the bottom ring, mm -hmm. you know, a few steps below that, mm -hmm. you know, who were who were getting their shows funded, who now aren't? Yeah. And I and I'm just wondering, like, where are those, you know, are those voices even going to come back, or are they just going to end up on YouTube, and where you have to build out your own fan base? That's a question, right? Or next tube, whatever that ends up being. Next like, tube, yeah. You know, because I, I feel like YouTube's having a big kind of exodus of like their top kind of uh, channels because of some new end user license agreement. I think that they rolled out and people are, that had had established channels are like, I think I may be walking away from this platform. So, oh, really? That's huge. I haven't read that. Yeah. Oh. I feel like that's going to, as long, whenever you, 
it's funny, like creativity and uh, public companies and stocks sometimes are kind of like oil and water mm -hmm. in that, you know, as long as you're beholden to a 10% increase that you have to provide to your shareholders every single year, um, that's why it's really interesting to see companies like Apple who do that through just their other products or companies like Amazon and no one really knows how Amazon makes money, but they make a lot of it. Um, because their, their TV businesses, you know, start off as kind of like these side hustles, right? So they're able, they don't really have like the same restrictions, it seems, as a lot of networks do because they're thinking like, oh, okay, is this going to add to our bottom line for this quarter? Is this going to add to our bottom line for next quarter? Whereas Apple TV doesn't do anything to the Apple stock. We sell 20 billion iPhones a day. So like, yeah. that's our moneymaker. And this is, you know, they had that show... Uh, you know, I've done a ton of home shows, obviously, over over the years, but like that Apple home show that I saw, I was like, this is so good. It was such a, I don't know if you checked it out, but definitely worth a watch. I haven't checked it out, but I've just, I've watched quite a lot of Apple TV yeah. content and it's all been like really high class, really well done, really well thought yeah. out. Um, beautiful cinematography, well edited, mm -hmm. great music. Like they're not, they're not skimping along no. in any way, shape or yeah. form. And you're right. Like it, it means absolutely nothing to the Apple bottom line. Mm -hmm. And, I, and that's great freedom they have, right? But yeah, what about... I don't even know if they, like, say, like, Apple TV or TV Plus has made us this much in their quarterly uh, earning reports, or if that's just kind of like a number that's jumped in with all the other numbers. Yeah, I don't even think they break it out. Yeah, who knows? Yeah, just part of their service. Yes. Yeah. yeah. It's a trade secret. Yeah. <laughs> Probably, but you're right. Like, you know, Warner Brothers, Universal, mm -hmm. Sony, like, they're all just fighting in ways that these big tech companies aren't. Mm -hmm. and uh, And it definitely affords the tech companies a lot more space. I just hope that they can, you know respect the relationships and respect the content creators and storytellers the yeah. same way that the studios have for years and hopefully they'll be like um and again this the other thing too is like the residuals have to come back mm -hmm. like you can't be making content as a storyteller uh you can't be telling stories and not getting royalties mm -hmm. because you know you know and i know sometimes you can work on a huge project for a year and then do nothing for six months absolutely and if you're not getting royalties for the previous content that you've or there's previous stories you've told and shared with the world like those those dry spells can be really tight mm -hmm. and uh and it and it's it really has to come back or else you're going to lose an entire generation of storytellers yeah 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 i think that's that's another reason for more creative storytellers to get into technology spaces too right like create new platforms mm -hmm. you know there's there's why is there just youtube and like a vimeo and you know what i mean and not something else that that is like you said more democratized like how many storytellers would it take to sit together and you know talk this out and figure out what kind of model can we create that we run we own and you know we can share resources and share profits um yeah i feel like anything bad that like people need stories people love watching things content movies film shorts whatever it is we need to be distracted by how sad the world is and you and and frankly use that content to make the world better yeah right? why not right motivate someone to be just like a little nicer tomorrow or whatever it is how huge how much bigger how much more successful was ted lasso on apple plus because we were all sad going through covid <laughs> sitting at home and here's this super happy guy from you know mid awesome. midwestern it, yeah right? who's this you know from kansas um you know who's super cheery and happy every day getting to coach football yeah. football in the uk and he doesn't understand anything about soccer right. like you know, like it's sometimes the right show with the right mood comes by in the right moment mm -hmm. and just becomes a hit because everyone's just sitting at home doing fucking nothing. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I love that show, man. It made like squeeze some tears out of me. Oh, for sure. It's, 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 <laughs> it's amazing. I have a prediction though. Like obviously YouTube is the, is the 900 pound gorilla in the room. They're massive. I think, um, in 2023, they, you know, they redistributed 6 billion us dollars to content creators on their platform from, massive. from ad sales. Yeah. So that's, that's huge. But you know what I think is going to happen? I think like YouTube is going to come out and say like, we're not going to accept like AI generated content. And then someone's going to create a platform like YouTube that only does AI. Yeah. Like the same way like Twitch. Yeah. Uh, Twitch, you know. Only does streaming. Only does live streaming yeah. and, and mostly gaming, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, and then of course Amazon bought that. So mm -hmm. I have a feeling that there'll be something that'll pop up that'll just be like AI centric. And it'll be all, you know, all these young people and older people who just like love animation graphic novels you know like and you know they're working on the cutting edge of what is cool yeah and then i think the studios and everyone like that is going to go to this platform and pull these people out to start making 
you know, mass market uh, entertainment. That'd be super interesting, man. I'd love to see it. One of those things, like there's anything bad that happens in our business, I feel like it just opens up a door for a new pocket, a new opportunity. Yeah, but you and I are getting older, right? Yeah. Like, so what happens when some technology comes around and just wipes us off the map? Like, how do we retool at 50? Yeah. Not that I'm, not that we're 50 yet, but yeah. it's coming. We're getting there. We're getting there. Um, Cause that's gotta be a sad place, right? Like being, being fired because of some new AI that got created and now you're unemployed at 50 being like, how do I learn a new skill so I can work is again? That, is that more just like a fear? Like, are we afraid or is that happening? Like, cause I don't know anyone that's been fired in our business for AI yet. No, not yet. It may happen next year. Like something, you know, there could be some monumental tech. Oh, it's coming. Yeah. yeah. Did you see the, did you see the Amazon, uh, fulfillment centers now have these like the humanoid robots? Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's happening. To, yeah. 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 They don't need healthcare. Yeah. I mean, they, yeah, they don't need healthcare. They you don't need workers comp insurance. You don't need to pay the fringes on them. Like yeah, bathroom breaks. Yeah. It's, it's, I mean, it's one of those things. Like if you stay ahead of it. I think as a creator, you'll be fine. Yeah. And like I said, there may be less of us. I feel like that's probably where it's going to go is that there'll be, you know, instead of a team with 10 editors, maybe you have two editors and a ton of AI agents that are assisting them. Maybe you have less story producers, you know, whatever it is, everything may slim down. Um, but I'm a big believer. Like it's never too late to learn some new thing. It's never too late to like, you know, I very, you know, I've, I've made the joke about like going back to school and like, studying computer science or something like that to help with all of this tool building. But like, it's never too late to do, to do that. Like, I don't look at that and say like, oh man, I'm 44. There's no way I can go knock out four years of school or. I feel like that. I'm too old. I can't do that. I can't sit there. I can't sit there. We have this idea, like we're supposed to have all our shit figured out at 20 something. And I think that's insane. I think that's insane. Everything after 25 is downhill. Yeah. No, just... <laughs> No, I know. I know what you mean. Like it's a, it's a constant learning process. Absolutely. I mean, especially like be humble, learn. Like I'm constantly learning. I, I, you know, I'm constantly like, I'll take a class or I'll try to learn some new thing. I'm trying to learn a uh, 3d uh, modeling. So I'm using this program shaper and it's super intuitive, but it's also a new world that I know nothing about mm -hmm. tools. And I just, I don't, I don't get it. So I'm just like every night I'm like, all right, I did 10 minutes tonight. I'll do like 10 minutes tomorrow. And maybe like after a hundred, 10 minute session, figure out. It is fun to learn how to do something new. Like yeah. I just set up this whole podcast thing, like pretty recently <laughs> and, um, and just kind of figured out how to do it. And actually there's been, so there's only two parts to this or there's three parts to this. Like one is, uh, connecting with people in a polite way and asking them to come in to chat with you, Yeah. which, so you're, you, so you're your own podcast booker. So that's interesting. So yeah. I spend like a half an hour to an hour a day, like reaching out to people, LinkedIn, X, Instagram, mm -hmm. like, Hey, um, I really like your work. You know, yeah. it's quite inspiring. Would you like to come and chat with me? By the way, we only do it face to face mm -hmm. here in the studio. You know, would you be open to, to coming in? And then the other thing is figuring out how to actually do it in the moment with the live switching and yeah. managing all this. And then the third thing is post, right? Yeah. And then of course, you know, putting it out into the world and tagging people mm -hmm. and networking and, and marketing and stuff like that. So, so it's been, it's been great to like learn all these yeah. new skills and it, it's been lucky cause I feel like I, See, so, so the thing you said you couldn't do, you're doing, but I don't want to go back to school for it. I don't want to <laughs> fucking sit in a chair, you know, and have to look up at someone teaching me. Like yeah. I rather just figure it out intuitively because totally if you love doing it, yeah. you'll figure it out. And yeah, you, I, I don't, I don't think school's a, a necessity, but grinding, like you made the point earlier, definitely. Yes. Yeah. For sure. Definitely yeah. gotta if you love it, you grind it. Yeah. Even if, even if you don't love it, if you're curious enough and you want to see what's next, grind it out. Yeah. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Yeah. So what's a, what's a dream project you've got on the go? What's something that's in your, in your ecosystem that you'd like to pull down and actually make happen sometime in the next year or two? Ah, oh, man. I, I don't even think that far ahead. I know yeah. more, I think more like in months. <laughs> I've got, I tell you, I've got like <laughs> 10 proposals for TV Two shows. Things. Yeah. I've got like. Cause anytime I think up of a new idea, I, I like, I write it up like, yeah. cause, cause that makes it real. Yeah. And then you've got a whole host of, you know, ideas and stories, whether it's travel, maybe hiking, trekking, or back on the motorcycle with tough rides or something like mm -hmm. they might be extensions of what I've already done or even something new, yeah. but I've always got like shows that I want to try to, you know, get back out into the world. And, um, but you know, it's funny, like I keep making these pitches and I keep, I keep, um, introducing myself and my past work and everything like that. And, and I'll just, the amount of people now who are just saying travel is on YouTube, travel is on YouTube. It's true. My mom, 
watches a ton of travel stuff. My mom watches a lot of travel yeah. stuff too. Yeah, she'll go in. He's like some Italian dude, travels the world and goes and eats stuff. You know what she does? My mom, my mom goes onto YouTube and 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 YouTube searches a location that she wants to visit, mm. and then she finds like people who go there and like do vlogs about you know where to grocery shop, where to have dinner, where to get your Airbnb or something like that, and all these. And then she goes and like copies them. And then she goes to that place and she's like, these, these people said this is where to go and this is the thing. And then she has a few of these like couples yeah. that are like semi-retired or retired or they're global, you know, they're digital nomads and they just go all around the world and they actually like lay out like how to, how to get there, you know, how, where to stay, where to eat, where to do this. And she's actually learning like at 72 or three she is, she's learning like how to travel the world based entirely on YouTube. That's, that is so cool. Yeah. She's learning some new shit. Yeah, <laughs> good for her. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, like, side projects, I would love to get my hands on that AI pin and maybe do some development, see if there's an opportunity for some uh, helping me with editing kind of thing. Um, You're right, because editing just hasn't changed. I don't think it will. If I need to take a break, is that possible? Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah you, you got to go use the restroom? Yeah, yeah. Go for it. No worries. How you do? Great. <laughs> Good. So, so I guess you're, you're, you know, the future of what you're trying to do, the future of like what you're focused on is actually trying to develop technology to make post-production and editing a little bit more seamless and a little bit more intuitive. A little bit more in the background, right? Like just out of your way. Yeah. And I feel like that, that I think is, yeah, that, that, that's one of those things where it's just like, I think back to like when I was learning the Avid, you know, media composer, it's such a steep learning curve especially when you have no background in film and, and like these nonlinear editors are hard to learn. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know if we'll be making content the same way. You know what I mean? I, we will, we will still be editing it. I just, you know, it's, it's definitely a mystery in my mind of like, what's, what does that look like in 10 years when we have a lot more capable AI? What does that look like in 10 years when we have even faster computers? Um, better projection systems yeah. like who knows that's interesting for me because you know obviously i produce my own show as well right so i get a budget mm -hmm. and then i have to decide how much of that's going to be for post-production mm -hmm. which is pretty fixed how much is going to be for production um and then you know in post-production you know it's like weeks of editors right yeah. so like you know how how many weeks does it take to edit a 146 minute tv show for bbc which is what we had to deliver and if you have three editors on week on one week that's three weeks of editing it is, yeah. <laughs> but if but if we can cut that down, to, you know, I would always only have one editor working with me um, at a time because we didn't have like a time crunch the way the way most shows are made. Like we had time to make stuff, and we made it at our at our own pace for the most part. Which but, is awesome. I mean, that's like that's that's the thing everybody wants. Right? Well, that's that's the risk. Of, that's the difficulty of making independent TV, right? Because yeah. what we would do is I would like I would use corporate partners or my speaking career to fill the gaps of a production budget, maybe get some of it up front, mm -hmm. um, and then go out and make it on my own pace, pick my own places, you know, do the post. And then when it was done, I would give it to an agent and then they would reach out to all the broadcasters and sell it. And we, and that worked really well, Yeah. but it meant, but, it, but I'm just thinking like, if I can, if, if it takes four weeks to do a 46 minute episode for an editor, and then all of a sudden, because of like certain AI tools we can do, uh, you know, we can do it in two weeks. Mm -hmm. Then I'm saving money, and then we can even make more content per year if we're cutting down on on the post production, which I was always much longer, yeah, and much more expensive. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think that's definitely something that's that's you know will be in our hands probably in the next few years, yeah. without question. I remember my first TV show. I was making um, like Tough Rides China. <laughs> so my brother and I we were like, okay, we're gonna make a TV show about riding a motorcycle like all around China. So we, so we thought we, we just spent our entire time focusing on like production. Okay. Like what cameras do we need? What cameras do we need on the bikes? Yeah. What, what cameras do we need on our bodies? Like where are we, and then, and then we went out and we shot this like great, you know, first TV show independently, yeah. total run and gun, really messy, but, but we got some great stuff. Yeah. And then we came back and we're like, what do we do now? And it was like, oh shit, like what, what's post-production? Like, yeah. okay, we need an editor. Like, and we didn't, we didn't have any of the back end planned. Yeah. Um, obviously we, we've learned a lot since then. I've learned a lot since then, but, but it just goes to show you like, and, and of course the, the, the post-production can be two or three times more expensive mm -hmm. than the actual like in field, in-person production. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, you know, a lot of the budgets, like that, that's where all the money goes to, mm. you know, aside from like, if you look at you're running, uh, an Abbott or a system for, 
500 bucks a week. You're renting storage for X amount of dollars per week. You have these editors on. The story producers also need Avid's and the co-EP also needs an Avid. Like each one of those licenses start adding up and that's before you even paid anyone yet. Yeah. It's, it's wild. It's it's yeah. crazy how prohibitively expensive it is yeah. to make like broadcast quality yeah. television. And also how expensive it is and how much cheaper it, how much less money you get to make it, how expensive it is, but still at the end of the day, significantly cheaper than it used to be, right? Mm -hmm. Because like you said, technology just keeps on driving those costs down for better or worse. For better or worse. Yeah. Yeah. We'll have to see. As a producer, it's quite exciting to keep driving costs down because yeah. I'm making in content independently. But then of course, if you're an editing professional or post-production professional, you want to be making sure like you're getting the same amount of money a year for the same amount of projects, which might also change. So it's yeah. going to be like, it's going to be a pretty interesting um, balancing act to make sure everyone kind of maintains a livable wage mm -hmm. or, or at least the, the wage that they were getting before. Absolutely. Like 10 years ago or something like that. So as you've been doing like a lot of this travel stuff and since you've done it over such a long kind of amount of time, where would you say, like, do you see, like, a lot of the travel shows and kind of expedition-type shows picking back up? Or no, not at all. Not at all. No. I mean, um, uh, like like I said, like, like, like all these produ pr producers and uh, creative directors have been telling me, like, every, like, everything in my genre is basically moving in, onto YouTube. And, of course, there's a lot of stuff on YouTube. Like, um, there's Mr. Beast, but he's off, off in his own world doing, yeah, he, like... He's using epic shit. Yeah, like <laughs> using him as a as a goal or a north star is terrible because yeah. he's he's totally off the wall and doing his own stuff yeah. very successfully. Yeah. But like another another kind of um like you could use like Yes Theory, which is also a pretty big channel and they mm -hmm. do travel stuff and they do like, you know, random shit. Like they go to Syria, you know, I saw one episode in Turkmenistan, like the world's strangest country. You know, they do all these quirky things, but they you know, they have V C backing. And, and stuff like that. Like they're not making their money on ad revenue and stuff like that or sponsorship like Mr. Beast is, who's kind of fully independent. Have you looked at any of those deals? Like what does it look like if you approach a private equity for something like that? Like what do they I, want? What do you do? Yeah. I haven't even really gone that way. Yeah. Like I think I, I think that I wouldn't like that. Yeah. Um, because I know myself mm -hmm. and I know that uh I need to be independent. Yeah. Cause I just I really struggle I, I wouldn't say like I'm a bad team player because I grew up playing team sports. Totally. And I love that. In but I but when it comes to like picking locations, making the content, the timing, the rhythm of an episode, yeah. working with my own team, like I just single vision is what works for you. Well, I think that's what we've lost. Yeah. Like I've I just like we've there's been so much um there how do I say this without getting canceled? <laughs> there's just been there's been so much talk of inclusion of other voices, and I'm not talking about race and gender and everything else, but but it's all encompassing of of taking in more voices mm -hmm. and and more um, more kind of directives from different people from different backgrounds, like up the food chain, kind of and down the food chain, yeah. like just at every level. And I really think it's changing the way con stories are being told, and I don't think it's I mean, it's great that these people are getting new jobs and it's great that people are getting this new experience and stuff like that, but I don't think it's making like better content. Yeah. Like I really feel like I'm kind of old school and whether the director is a white guy, an African-American woman, you know, a, 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 a non-binary person or, or whatever the spectrum is, I just want to see that single voice carried through the whole thing. And and whoever the director is would or the produced showrunner would have that, my single you commit to a vision is what you're saying. Right? Yeah, because I feel like a lot of the stuff we're watching now is like really flippy floppy. And I think it's flippy floppy because in the writer's room, you know, there's too many voices going back and forth and no one Maybe coming down. Lawyers get it. <laughs> yeah. But I'm like, ah, I don't know if we could say this or yeah, who knows, right? Yeah, but you know, like at the same time, like, you know, you have the you know, you have someone like, let's say, for example, like a Seth McFarlane. Okay. He's you know, he's done Family Guy for twenty twenty plus years. Uh, he's not so involved in that anymore. American Dad, again, not so involved in it anymore, but got it started. Now he's doing TED on Peacock and, and things like that. But that's like someone who is in complete control yeah. in the driver's seat 100%. And you can see the vision mm -hmm. like through. It's the Boston accent. It's the Boston jokes. Mm -hmm. It's the comedy. You know, and, and uh, yeah, Seth MacFarlane is a white male and that's who he is. And he's been in this business for a long time. He's made great stuff. So, you know, I don't care if he's white or whatever, but 
like having that one person in control making all the decisions and and having it land or miss like that's fine right but as long as it's i don't i've never i've never been so upset like watching something where you can feel a single vision and have it not hit because at least they they gambled right and they went for it yeah now everyone's just trying to dance on the line instead of like follow it straight through yeah and i feel like the content we're watching the stories we're watching are less powerful mm -hmm. and 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 again like where you have strong directors like who are a hundred percent in control of what they're doing um uh like um what's his face like uh is it jordan peel key and mm -hmm. peel um with all the the scary the horror the horror movies. movies yeah like there there's a there's a get get out get out was one of them. the ufo one the, the recent one he did yeah i can't remember what that was called either but I, but but again like that's a example of like a director having 100 percent control over over project and seeing it through from start to finish yeah i just feel like now i don't know things are just getting a little strange and we're everyone's shying away from like strong leadership which doesn't seem like a good direction to go yeah maybe. i'm hoping if, you know that you know as things kind of expand and contract and fold and unfold that you do get some of that back again yeah i mean yeah. it's all it's just goes too far one way and then it comes back the other way and yeah i but it's it's funny like because it's the first time i've seen it i it's the, I, it's the first time since 2010 where i've seen the the pendulum swing out of my zone mm -hmm. Like it went right past me, and, and and so now I'm wondering if it's going to come back or if I should try to come at it in a different way. Yeah, yeah, I'm I'm, I'm really curious. I'm curious if, if private equity may be like a, a path that surprises you that maybe they don't like you know you get VC funding and maybe they don't want to have their fingers in the pie and they just have you as part of their thing and you know I don't know I'm, I'm curious to see because I feel like it's it's not been bad in other industries. I mean. Sure, it's it's in, it destroyed some things, but yeah. um, I don't know. That may be a way to get it because, like, people who don't make content really, some of them don't really want their fingers in it. They just rather hire people and get out of their way. That was like some famous quote that Steve Jobs used to get all the time: uh, is that he just hired the best people that he could and get out of their way. And I always thought, like, man, that's kind of if that's really the way he he was doing it, that's a great way to run a company and a great way to just kind of you know, get people to step up into their roles and everything. I just couldn't, I, I'm just such a purist. Like I couldn't imagine myself going to Bhutan yeah. and doing like a 30 day trek through Northern Bhutan. And then every episode having to do like a jobs.com or recruiter.com like advertisement while I'm 16,000 feet on the side of a mountain, you know, to camera. Yeah. I just feel like that would just fucking ruin it so much, <laughs> even though it might pay for the whole episode and you know, just it just pulls the audience out of the moment. Yeah. I guess maybe I don't know. Like, I think that's the real difference actually between a lot of the content on YouTube and a lot of the content that we made for traditional streaming partners. Like, when we were in it, we were in it for forty six minutes, and when we edited it and we produced it and we, you know, we filmed it, we wanted a cohesive forty six minute story where the audience kind of got deeper into what was happening to me mm -hmm. and the people around me every minute till the end when there was some kind of like finish yeah and that was the goal like this build up right but now i feel like with a lot of the stuff on youtube like people are throwing in advertisements people are like you know breaking the fourth wall and chatting with the audience a little bit mm -hmm. and it's it's a totally different style of storytelling and i'm just not sure if i'm too much of a purist where i don't think i could even do that with a straight face <laughs> like i'm just i i, I want to be in it every minute so that the audience is in it every minute yeah i don't want to break that wall that feel yeah that the momentum the feeling all the stuff you have going behind that story absolutely yeah that makes total sense. i just feel like it cheapens the, the experience because you're in this amazing place in the middle of nowhere and you're going through something that's grueling right mm -hmm. and you want the audience to be right with you every step yeah you don't want them to be thinking for you and yeah you want to be thinking about like oh yeah recruiter.com yeah i need to hire some back office staff for my company i i'll make a note of that and yeah. and then it's like oh yeah and, and ryan's still in bhutan yeah I mean, maybe instead of doing that, you could just like at, at the end when you're in post, just do a little compositing of a logo on the back of your jacket as you're climbing up the mountain, you know, to plant your flag or whatever it is. Well, the corporate sponsorship is very interesting. So like I'm a watch ambassador for mm -hmm. Glauschuta Original, which is a watch company in Germany. Okay. And that's no secret. Like I do global campaigns for them. That's awesome. And and that they're really wonderful because I get, I get an annual salary and we do some commercials and mm -hmm. I do some live events and things like that. But then I can use that money um, 
to put into to mix to making more shows right That's awesome yeah so so they don't give you any kind of like they don't sandbox you in and say you have to use that for our kind of content if you do use it you can use it for whatever yeah i'm just supposed to wear the watch in like all the shows and live events and stuff like i should actually have it on right now sorry guys um but <laughs> but um but it's in post <laughs> <laughs> But, but it's, um, you know, I think I do have a clause in the contract saying like, if I, you know, if I end up like Robert Downey Jr. in the early nineties, uh, the contract gets canceled. Okay. Um, okay. Good. uh, but it's, um, but it's been great. So if I can maybe line up a few more of those yeah. corporate contracts where, you know, it's, it's expected that the money that I get goes into content creation, you know, not, um, buying a Ferrari and driving mm -hmm. down Sunset Boulevard too fast on a Friday night or something like that, then maybe that's like. Maybe that's a, a way forward where I can just sponsor the content, or maybe the YouTube channel gets big enough where I can get a cost per click that's enough to actually sponsor more, yeah. con more storytelling. And I think that's, I think that's the way I'd want to go because I I really struggle like being beholden to others. Yeah, yeah. I feel like that's why we need a new platform for for creators. You know, that gives them some kind of ownership. I feel like that's a big problem with just like social everything right every social platform is that you are the product you are pumping out content and for the most part not getting paid for it um at least not as much as you should be for what you're generating right yeah so it'd be nice to have someone you know i don't think i'm the person for it but to have somebody come up with something because i think there is a model that can be cracked in that space of where creators you know high value content creators that are maybe just below like being able to get their thing on an Apple TV or whatever it is, have this other place to go to. Yeah. I just don't think that place exists for us yet. Or maybe it's a Rogan style deal where, you know, where someone is producing YouTube content at such a high quality mm -hmm. um, and builds such a strong fan base doing travel content that maybe like a Spotify or an Apple gives them a deal to, to kind of make a, you know, a TV show, yeah. like a, like a, a little something we would see on linear TV shows like 10 years ago, but now it's on an Apple or a Spotify. Or maybe it's this kind of like this new money mm -hmm. coming in to take something that's done at a really at a really good you know quality and then bringing yeah. it bringing it to their audience and maybe you know it's not it doesn't have to be like a hundred million dollar deal like Rogan got or whatever but it can be it could be something similar where you're just creating you know for that platform mm -hmm. and that could be that could be really interesting but of course you'd have to you'd have to be proven on a platform like YouTube or or something like that and have to have millions of views and, yeah. and even start to have that conversation. Yeah, I mean, you know, the funny thing is, like, technologically, we're at a place now where, like, if you wanted to, you could have your own video servers streaming out your channel, especially as you're small now. You can get, like, co-located server space somewhere. Um, it's so much easier to do that today. The hard part is still marketing and driving people to your site or where, you know, your little shingle of the world where you're pumping that content out. That's always going to be the hard part. Yeah, and I think that's what everyone expects you to do. Yeah. Like, everyone's like, oh, you have to, like, build your own clubhouse. With your own network, yeah. basically. Yeah. Like, and I think, like, I, one comedian told me, like, one comedian uh, that I, I follow quite closely, like, he was just saying, like, building a house mm -hmm. and putting all of your audience inside and then all of your content inside. And, you know, that's why all these comedians are doing podcasts now, too, right? Yeah. Then they can pimp, you know, where, which cities they're going to be in over the next few months. And yeah. They can, you know, well, we're filming this TV show. It's dropping here, you know, Friday night. I'm going to be at the mm -hmm. comedy club. Next week I'm in Kansas City, mm -hmm. you know, and come find me, whatever. And it's just, you, it's just like a one-stop shop for everyone who's in your ecosystem yeah. of being like a fan. And I think that 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 is the path that we're in now. Mm -hmm. But I think it's going to be very different, like five years from now. Yeah, absolutely. It's crazy times, man. Yeah, it's it's going to be interesting. Um, but I think you're right. Like the technology side of it is going to be pushing everything. Yeah. I mean, like right now, there's a lot of really great. Um, solo travelers mm -hmm. who are out doing what I used to do with extreme treks, mm -hmm. you know, for BBC and stuff. They're doing it by themselves with really high quality 4k cameras and with drones, but they're doing it as like silent treks. Uh, so go onto YouTube and like, go, you know, search, um, silent trekking. And you'll see like, there's four or five people who are getting like a million views per video. And all they're doing is going out by themselves for like seven or 10 days, tripod camera, just filming themselves, walking through frames using a follow, you know, drone app, um, mm -hmm. you know, having them walk through beautiful places with the drone, just hovering behind them, which you can set up on your own. And, but there's no audio and they're not talking to the audience and they're not educating the audience and there's no other people in the there's show. No, like not sound like air, wind, nothing. There's, I think there's some like air and wind sometimes, but most of it is just like 
kind of relaxing music and kind of underlaying it, you know, stuff that you can get on YouTube or, or an audio library or something like that. Um, but they're doing it and they're kind of doing it completely independent. And they seem to be making enough money to keep it going on their own. One person. Yeah. For, yeah. for one person. Yeah. Not talking, not, not recording audio, which is a totally different game. Yeah. Because once you get into audio, that's where things get, can get really hairy. Yeah. And then of course they're editing it probably by themselves. Yeah. So they're, so they're limited as to how much content they can make a year. Right. Like we did 10 up. Ep- the biggest year I ever had was we made, um, the biggest year I ever had. We did eight episodes of Extreme Treks for BBC. So that's eight expeditions in eight countries. And I think we shot on five continents. And then at the same time, I did a 74-day motorcycle trip across Canada for like a tourism partnership with Tourism Canada. Oh. So I did I did eight episodes for BBC. And then we went on this two and, two and a half month ju- film expedition across Canada doing this. Uh, and I think we did 24... We did tw- like 24, 12 minute episodes for them. And they, that was on um, just digital, right? It's on my YouTube channel as well. But that was, that was insane. It was like 300 days of production mm. um, that year. And there's no way I could have done that if I was shooting by myself, editing by myself, you know, doing all these things. So it really does limit you if you don't have that money to, to you know, surround yourself with people who lighten the load. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Oh man, it's such a mystery what's going to happen, right? Like. It's exciting. Yeah. And I love chats like this where you can just kind of like catch up, learn, yeah. learn about what people are doing and then figure out, you know, where this, where the space is going to head. Absolutely. Yeah. Love to come back in a couple months, see if I've made any tools or something. Yeah. That'd be interesting. If yeah. you, if you unlock some, uh, some, some secret, <laughs> let, let me know. We'll get back on the, I'll get good. back on the mics. Is there anything else you want to talk about? Are we good? I think we're good, man. This was great. It was a lot of fun. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. Well, thanks for swinging by. Yeah, absolutely. Do it again. So now we do this. Go to the... Thanks for swinging by. Thank you, man. Amazing to meet you. You too. Take care. All right. That was fun. And we're out.